is your future place to study. This is the best place to ask your questions. If you are watching us in workshop, you can uh, see that next to every info session that we are hosting during these four days, you have a Q&A button, which you can press and then leave your question. And then we will answer these questions online. If you can see that your question has already been asked, then you can just uh, rate your question and then we will see this question first on the list. And uh, uh, if you are watching us from Facebook or from YouTube, you can also leave your questions there. My colleagues are going to answer them in written form. Or if you want your questions to be answered online, you can also uh, join WorkSub by the link which was sent previously to you. So this would be it from the introduction part. I hope you enjoy our event and this amazing week. Uh, which will be full of information that hopefully will be useful for you and for your future. And today we are going to start our first, uh, uh, first info session, which is going to be dedicated to medical sciences. And today with me, I have two programs that I have two speakers that are going to introduce two new programs. They just started their intake uh, or admissions uh, this year. Uh, so we have here uh, Alastair, Alastair Forbes, who is going to present clinical nutrition and who is joining us online all the way from the United States. And then here with me on the stage, I also have Jana Las, who is going to talk about clinical pharmacy. Uh, so the program is going to be as follows. At first, we are going to have a presentation in clinical about clinical nutrition. Uh, then Jana will talk about uh, uh, clinical pharmacy, and then we are going to open Q&A session. I would kindly ask you if you have any questions, you can already start leaving them. So they appear the first during the Q&A session and uh, uh, we can answer them. Uh, so I guess uh, we can start with the first uh, presentation and I will give a floor to Alastair. Thanks very much. Good morning to everyone. Or as I've learned to say in Estonia, Terehomikust. Now, as you've heard, I am in the United States. That's only because I'm here on holiday, actually, because it's half term for the schools. And um, you'll excuse me if I look a bit red eyed and tired because it's actually uh, 2.30 in the morning. here. <laughs> uh, a little bit of background about myself. I'm a clinical gastroenterologist, but for the past 20 years or so, my main focus has been clinical nutrition. And that's been from the point of view of clinical practice with lots of patients with serious nutritional problems, but also a great deal of education, not least through the European Society's Lifelong Learning Programme, and a lot of nutrition-related research. And we're trying to incorporate all those aspects of clinical practice, teaching, education and research into this new master's programme that I'm going to be telling you about. So if I could have the first slide now. Let's see if this clicker machine works. Yes. Now, probably by now most of you have worked out where Estonia is, right up in the northeastern corner of Europe. And Tartu itself is in the relatively southeast part of Estonia. It's a very, very good place to be. And I've been in Tartu now for 18 months, and I'm loving it, and I encourage those of you that are undecided from a geographical point of view, is it a good place to go? The answer is yes. And I'll give you a few pictures to support that as we go through. So the masters, we are intending that this is going to be quite a demanding course. It's not going to be an easy option. It's going to be a serious program of hard work. But I think it's also going to be extremely rewarding. And I think actually, it's going to be fun. It will be the only master's course in clinical nutrition anywhere in the European Union. I was responsible for setting up a similar course in the UK, but now with Brexit, the UK is non no longer in the European Union. This will be the only one where there is a master's course devoted to clinical nutrition. 
There are others in basic science type nutrition, in nutrition for, for dietetic practice, but in terms of a clinical nutrition perspective, for the whole spectrum of people interested in nutrition, this will be the only one in the European Union. So the structure is fairly straightforward. The first year is predominantly a talk course and consists of a combination of lectures, seminars, tutorials. Clearly, you will know, the course is entirely in English, so there's no need to worry about having to learn Estonian, although I hope those that join the course that don't speak Estonian will actually be encouraged and enthused to want to learn. It's a very complicated but also very interesting language, and um, it's obviously helpful to be able to communicate in the local language with, with, with the people that you're interacting with. Um, so that's the first year. It's a fairly conventional university style of talk course, but it will be very interactive and there'll be plenty of opportunity for um, work by the students to be presented, to be discussed, and there will be a more or less daily requ a requirement almost for student participation. So we'll be asking questions, we'll, we'll be saying, you know, why do you think that? And we'll be giving tasks for the following day, for the following week, for people to work on, and that will consist of informal uh, multiple choice questions, short essays, a variety of things throughout the course. So there'll be a lot of in-course assessment. Um, then when we move to the second year, this is then really more innovatory, innovatory, innovative. Uh, it, it, the large part of the second year is devoted to the research project. That will be of the student's choice. We will give suggestions, we'll give recommendations, and we'll help people to decide exactly what to do. But we want it to be something that the student wants to do. So something that's likely to be relevant to their own career. And that can be done in Tartu, or it can be done somewhere else in Estonia, or it can be done in the student's own home environment. So if they want, if there's a particular topic that's relevant to them locally, then they can do that project locally in their own institution or alternatively in another nutrition centre somewhere in the world. And as long as we've got a, an academic link of some sort with that other site, that will be absolutely fine. And, and that, that takes up about two thirds of the second year. But there's also an internship, which is an opportunity for incorporating what you've learnt with the master's course into clinical practice that's relevant to you for what your clinical practices and we'll make sure that that's in a good centre and again that probably won't be in Tartu, that probably be in a nutrition centre somewhere else in Europe. And then there is the elective which is exactly what it says, it's an opportunity for the student to do exactly what they want. The University of Tartu is actually quite keen that people use that as an opportunity of learning Estonian, so actually to do a specific Estonian course I and mean, that's an option but it can be anything you want. The course finishes off in terms of the teaching component by what we call breaking news and that's that's a, a module similar in structure to the modules of the first year in the sense it's got a mixture of lectures seminars and tutorials but that is completely focused on work that is brand new and so there won't be anything in that breaking news session that is more than a year old absolute maximum a year old and a lot of it will be newer than that so it will be material from uh, recent publications recent conferences, seminars, and an opportunity to be absolutely up to date. And that, that, that will be quite an entertaining thing, not just for the students, but also for the speakers. And at the end of all that, 120 credits, these are standard transferable European credits recognised by any, Euro any European and pretty well any university around the world, and clearly absolutely full master's status from any organisation wanting to assess the students' um, qualities and calibre at the end. And as you will know, Tartu has a, an excellent reputation as one of the top world universities. This is the main historic central building of the university, which is in the city centre. And you see that perhaps you can probably can't see in the logo of the university that the university is very very long established 1632 it's been going for a long long time it's very very well established one of the oldest universities in Europe but it's also got modern stuff this is Biomedicum which is the main um, clinical sciences building the basic science sciences for medicine where some of the course will take place but we'll also use the 
University Hospital. So this is the Clinicum, and um, it's a mostly brand new thousand bed hospital on the outskirts of the city and you get an idea of what, what it's like inside. That's the main atrium of the hospital and, and, and much of the course will be based here in, in the hospital. So it's obviously right up against where the patients are. So truly a clinical environment. As for the... We lost a slide there. No. Okay, so malnutrition. Why, why are we thinking about a, a course in clinical nutrition? Because malnutrition is so important, it is very, very common, and malnutrition adds to the severity of pretty well every form of disease. And that's true when we talk about undernutrition and loss of weight and being undernourished, but it's also true, of course, of overnutrition. And although the main focus of the, the course will be on undernutrition, it will also consider the difficulties of obesity and some of the effects that, that has on clinical practice. So we know that malnutrition in all its forms increases morbidity. People are more sick because of malnutrition. It increases mortality and without any question it increases the human and the finan financial costs of any form of illness. However, Malnutrition is often missed. We know that around 30 to 35 percent of people admitted to hospital have malnutrition, but very, very often indeed that's missed. And it's missed because people are focusing on the other thing. The patients come in with a heart attack or bad pneumonia or something else. And the fact that they've got or developed malnutrition is not picked up, not thought about. That problem has largely been identified, and healthcare systems around the world are now trying to do something about this. But as they try to do something about it, they then realise that there aren't the professionals with knowledge and expertise in clinical nutrition to provide that help for the patients. So we've got a problem with malnutrition. It can be dealt with by the masters in clinical nutrition. This is an obvious solution. And it really is something that is being taken on board very seriously that this, that this course is of great interest, not just to the university, but also to the hospital in Tartu, which is giving a lot of support. And you can see how it's important for, for healthcare organisations, institutions around the world. We've got a very strong local faculty, as well as myself. I'm the director of the course, but there are people from all disciplines within the hospital and the university environment of, of relevance to nutrition. We've got a panel of visiting international teachers, and we seem to have lost the little flags. We had little flags on that. It obviously hasn't come through on the upgra upgraded slide, but um, a range of international teachers. These are people that I know personally. I know that they are very good teachers as well as decent people, and that's ranging from as far apart as, as France, Serbia, Denmark, even Great Britain, lots of places all, all around Europe will be contributing. And when I say they're contributing, these international speakers will not come and give one lecture and then disappear again on the next plane. That, that we don't think is very useful. Each of them will spend at least three or four days in Tartu. They will give at least three or four lectures, but they will be contributing in a, in a greater way than that. They will come, they'll sit in on the sessions, they will interact with the students in much the same way that our local teachers will. So they, they really will make a, a big contribution to the course in, in, the, in, the, in the course of the two years. And the other advantage of that is that each of them represents their own specialist nutrition centre in their various different cities. And there will therefore be an additional opportunity to get to know those people and opportunities for electives and internships in all of those countries. So, you know, if you fancy going to, to Lisbon or to um, Athens or to London, that will be a possibility as well that will be aided by the, the way the course develops. So what about Tartu? Tartu is the principal university city of Estonia. It's where the only medical school is. And the city itself will be the European City of Culture in 2024. Uh, I think something like 20% of the population of, of Tartu at any one time is students. It's very much a, a student-orientated city. 
full of museums. It's the only city I know that's got three science museums and theatres, concert halls, but it's also a great place for living and whether that's sports that you're interested in, um, plenty of restaurants, shops, bars, it, it's actually a really, really great place to live. And you might have noticed, I showed you the picture earlier of the main building of, of the Tata University and I said it's in the city centre. Now you can see that same building in this picture and yet there are all those green trees there. That is it is the city centre. That's, that's tell me, Maggie, that's the, the hill behind the university. That is in the city centre. And everything is in walking distance. So that's the um, Raikoeplatz, that's the, the main town hall square. And you can see in the summer it's full of bars, people, sunshine. And in the winter, the same place, it's turned into a Christmas market and stalls and hot drinks and really, really nice time. And oh, oh and the other thing there, there's a, there's a nice skating rink. You can't quite see it in that picture, but immediately in front of the town hall for three months over the Christmas period, ice rink in the, in the open air just outside the town hall. It's, it's, it's really good fun. And plenty of other things. There was a, a big international professional um, cycling championship in the, in the city a, a few months ago. Um, you can take part in rather curious historic student parades. I've absolutely no idea what this means, but there, there, there were four gangs. There were, there were these pink ones, but there were also yellow ones and blue ones. Goodness only knows. It's some historic student tradition, but quite clearly everyone had a really good time. And um, everyone in Estonia learns to ski. So this is my little boy's um, school run. They, they, everyone learns to ski and of course you can learn to ski as well and it's really good fun and very easy and um, something that's quite normal. But there are, there are also more, more ordinary things that happen everywhere. This is one of the bars in, j just outside the city centre. There's a little rest restaurant area, um, little bars and, and family type restaurants just, just a, across the main road. And um, I rather like this bar as well, which is which is right on the river, and um, you can see again everyone's out in the sunshine. Alistair, sorry, uh, you have one minute left. Sorry for interrupting. Yeah, one that's minute. okay. We've almost finished. This is the last slide. Um, so the masters in clinical nutrition very much suitable for anyone with a health science background. We, we're interested in people from any discipline, um, anticipating that that will be a, a combination of doctors, nurses, but also people with a scientific interest in nutrition. And I'm looking looking forward to having the opportunity to talk, to talk it through more, answer any questions there might be, and um, hopefully seeing you in Tartu. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for this amazing presentation. Uh, I would like to remind you that you can leave your questions and I can see already that you started uh, asking questions, so please leave them. Also, it's worth to mention that Alastair is a founder of the program. So this is a very good time to ask the questions if you're interested to apply to clinical nutrition program. And right now, I think we are going to move to another presentation and I will give a floor to Jana, who is going to talk about clinical pharmacy. Hello, everybody. Is it... This, can you listen? So I, I don't see yet my slides, but I will start uh, presenting who I am. So I'm a clinical pharmacist. Uh, I'm the first clinical pharmacist uh, in Estonia. Uh, I'm gradu I graduated uh, from uh, the School of uh, Northern Ireland, uh, Queen's University Belfast. And uh, since then, we have uh, started the clinical pharmacy here in Estonia. And uh, with our good uh, colleagues, uh, uh, we established this program. And I'm the um, coordinator of this program, but also one of the teachers there. So uh, <clears throat> here in this slide, uh, you can see uh, our uh, everyday environment. Um, I'm working as a consultant in intensive care department and here are my colleagues and, and nurses from the department. And can you move? Oh, okay, I can move the slides myself. So um, thank you Alster for introducing Tartu and University of Tartu, but uh, I'm not going to talk about uh, our beautiful city uh, because uh, this program uh, is a fully full online uh, program and uh, uh, you can visit Tartu only for the uh, practice or internship. Uh, so we, we don't expect uh, you, uh, uh, we don't see you here in Tartu probably. 
And the duration of, of this program is uh, three semesters. It's shorter uh, because uh, we only want to give you uh, 60 credit points uh, because um, we expect everybody who are uh, coming to, to study clinical pharmacy already to have finished uh, pharmacy master's uh, degree, ha having pharmacy master's degree. And the language is uh, also here uh, English. Um, we are different uh, compared to clinical nutrition program because we really need uh, you to have a, a master's degree in, uh, in pharmacy because we are not going to teach the basic pharmacy subjects uh, and this one is really needed uh, for you to study clinical pharmacy. And uh, we also need uh, quite high uh, English language proficiency because um, we, we study in English. And, uh, and we are really looking at your motivation letters because uh, uh, the, the clinical pharmacist uh, needs to be really motivated to do their work and, uh, and therefore we are also having with you an entrance interview. Uh, so how we are studying? If, uh, if the classical pharmacy is taught, like also you have a lectures, you have a topics, but uh, here we, we mainly study, uh, use a problem-based learning, uh, which mimics the real life. Uh, so mainly we have um, uh, different topics that we are going to cover, but uh, uh, you are going to have like a clinical case uh, and uh, you have to uh, solve the clinical case uh, and find a clinical pharmacist role. Uh, because uh, there are quite, uh, in, in Europe also, uh, established the roles uh, for the doctors and for the nurses at the hospital and also at ambulatory level. But the pharmacists uh, have kind of uh, more traditional roles and the role of clinical pharmacist is a bit different. So we really have to work in, in teams of, uh, of uh, other medical faculties and uh, therefore we we really are strongly looking at the rational and evidence-based uh, pharmacotherapy uh, the, uh, uh, to implement it into daily treatment. And uh, for the first year, we, we have uh, different clinical topics and it, uh, the studies are divided into study weeks. Uh, usually the one topic is uh, one to three weeks long. And here you uh, have uh, e-lectures. We are not going to waste our time for uh, giving real-time lectures. Uh, they are recorded and you can um, look at the lectures uh, the time, uh, at the time when, which is suitable for you. And uh, uh, we use different uh, methods of learning, like we have uh, self-learning tests and, uh, and this e-lectures and additional materials. And uh, mainly during these lectures, uh, you can gain the knowledge of this basic subjects and, and, uh, and uh, treatment uh, regimens for uh, specific uh, um, diseases. And the second year is uh, dedicated to a master's thesis and also there is a, a clinical training. And, uh, and the, we have, um, as I already told, over 20 different clinical topics, uh, like cardiology, pediatrics, but we are not going to teach you cardiology, but uh, we are going to teach you to find the role of a clinical pharmacist inside the topic of cardiology. So um, additionally, we have elective modules for those who are interested, for example, in uh, we also have a topic of clinical nutrition or uh, palliative care, which are not maybe these who you see ev every day. And, uh, and the clinical cases uh, are uh, uh, coming from real life uh, because uh, uh, similarly to myself, uh, all of uh, our tutors are working, uh, most, most of our tutors are working as a, as a clinical pharmacist in real life. And uh, uh, you are therefore working mainly uh, uh, 
uh, alone, uh, you are studying alone during the week, uh, but uh, every week we have a webinar which is uh, online and we really expect everybody to participate and the webinars are, are on Wednesday evenings so you have a, a time to study uh, during the weekend before the webinar and the webinars are places where you present your homework, uh, your clinical cases and also uh, here you can uh, discuss with uh, tutors about the questions that uh, coming up uh, regarding different topics. Uh, so this is the time we can um, be together and uh, usually for every topic we have two uh, tutors uh, to, to give a bit broader overview of, of the specific topic and uh, tutors are usually from different countries for, for all the uh, topics. And um, uh, in addition to this uh, open uh, online webinars, uh, we, we have forums and we are interacting uh, inter via internet. So we also have international uh, program uh, regarding the tutors, uh, because uh, the, in Estonia the clinical pharmacy is quite newly established. And um, the uh, other reason why we use uh, international tutors is that uh, really the clinical pharmacists who are teaching are the teacher practitioners. Uh, we are not so much involved with the universities, but we are uh, all of us are more involved with the, in, inside the hospitals. So I'm also working at the Tartu University Hospital, and uh, and uh, we have uh, uh, we have been looking at tutors who are uh, also our good colleagues and friends. From from different countries. Uh, for example, the, our Icelandic colleague is giving uh, uh, is, is, is a tutor about uh, clinical oncology and our German uh, tutor is working as a clinical pharmacist at the Hospital of uh, Psychiatry. So they are really very specialized uh, and, uh, and I think it's the only way to teach clinical pharmacists to teach what we are doing every day and incorporate uh, science uh, into it. And um, uh, basically, these are the things that we are promoting and, uh, and very important uh, thing is how to work multidisciplinary in, in clinical environment. So it's not very uh, common to pharmacists to work in a team. We are a bit afraid of, uh, sometimes afraid of doctors, uh, uh, but uh, uh, that's we are really supporting uh, our role in, in a medical team. And... Um, and uh, uh, we are quite uh, focused uh, to support people from Eastern Europe because the clinical pharmacy is not established here. So I was studying in UK in, uh, in, in Queen's University of Belfast and, and what I felt uh, uh, lacking most was the support uh, how to establish the practices. So that's what we are doing here. We, are, we know that uh, people come from uh, uh, countries or cities where clinical pharmacy is not uh, really available and uh, also uh, we, we focus a lot uh, to make decisions as a pharmacist because pharmacists usually don't make many medical decisions but here we help you to start uh, uh, doing that and also the communication and what is uh, is also very very important is uh, we we help you to develop a, a network of colleagues internationally uh, you who you can rely on your professional life uh, later if you if you graduate so we have uh, facebook groups and and uh, and really good uh, supporting system so uh, welcome to everybody and looking forward to your questions thank you for uh, your wonderful presentation and for introducing your program. Uh, Jana is also one of the founders of the program, so it's a very nice uh, uh, opportunity to actually ask the questions from the founders of our new programs. And I guess we can uh, move to our Q&A session right now and answer the questions that we have received uh, in WorksUp. 
I will also encourage you to still ask your question. We still questions. We still have uh, half an hour or 25 minutes until the end of this uh, info session. So you will have a wonderful chance to actually get your get the answers to your questions immediately online. Uh, so the first question that was asked is uh, addressed to uh, Jana. Um, hello. I want to ask about the need to have a master's degree or equivalent qualification in pharmacy as admission requirement. Because I have a bachelor's degree of doctor of, of pharmacy, which is clinically oriented, and we have additional 56 hours on the program, more than that of the pharmacy bachelor program, all of which are clinical oriented subjects, and I have more than four years of work experience in a clinical pharmacist. Will that be enough? Uh, yes, this is kind of difficult for us uh, because uh, the pharmacy uh, education is really different in different countries uh, and some are uh, like more re re close to United States and in Asia we have a totally different systems. But uh, basically for us the bachelor degree is not enough because uh, 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 we need some basic subjects to, to be taught uh, at a certain level. But uh, we already are starting to a bit uh, modify our admission uh, requirements regarding the information we received from Asia, for example. It's, uh, it's going to be like a four-year studies uh, or equivalent to a master's degree, but please contact us uh, directly so we can uh, check your papers and, and give advice. Uh, yes, you can also see uh, in works up the name of the presenter, so you can also contact directly afterwards, or you can also contact our admission office by writing to admissions at dot ut dot e. Um, so another question is about differences uh, between opportunities in Tartu and Tallinn. So are there differences in terms of opportunities if we compare Tartu and with Tallinn? Alastair, since you were talking about Tallinn and opportunities in Tallinn, maybe you can take this question yeah, and comment well, on that. Obviously, Tallinn is the capital of the country. It's bigger. Um, but Tartu is very much a university city. And I think, I mean, I, I draw the analogy when I'm talking to people in the UK. I say that, that Tartu is, is like Oxford or Cambridge. It's not big city London, but it is an academic environment that's very much student orientated. Everything's in walking distance. I really love being in Tartu. It's, it, everything I want to do, I can do on foot or on the free bicycles. Well, it's not quite free. It's 30 euros a year for a, for a Tartu bike pass. And you, you can cycle anywhere in the city. I, I, so I cycle to and from the, the hospital campus, which is where the medical faculty building is. Um, yeah, it's not the capital, but you know what? What are you looking for? Um, there's plenty of sport. There's plenty of bars. There's plenty of people, and it's a really, really nice place. I suppose it's it's further from the airport. So if you're planning to fly somewhere once a week or something like that, <laughs> that's a bit inconvenient. But you know, for for all practical purposes, I, I think it's a really, really good place to be. And that's not to say Tallinn isn't a good place, and Tallinn is a perfectly good place too. But in in terms of a choice. For a student base, I think Tartu is an absolutely excellent place to be, and that does I've I've been I've been in Tartu now for eighteen months, and I'm really very very happy there. Thank you very much for your answer. Let's move to the next question, and the next question is addressed to uh, clinical pharmacy. So, since the program is conducted online, should I come to Tartu for the sessions, or uh, I don't need to come to Tartu at all? Yeah, uh, basically you don't need to come to Tartu because we are really expecting people from uh, uh, quite far. Like we, at the moment we have uh, uh, people from uh, Singapore, for example, and uh, only um, only moment that you really need to be. Uh, mm, maybe outside your own ho home <laughs> is that you you need to have this clinical practice which we we are planning to 
organize, like uh, you can also do it in your own country. Then we have to find a tutor and we have like a, uh, uh, like a system how you uh, go through the practice or internship. But uh, you can visit Estonia and we are really ha happy to also to help you to go to another country where you find uh, your favorite tutor, for example, if you want to see how a psychiatrist uh, working with a pharma clinical pharmacist, then you can go to Germany. We can do that one. <laughs> Thank and you. I should have said, I don't know, can you hear me? Yeah. I, I should have said as well that although the um, Clinical Nutrition Masters is designed as a course where people will be in Tartu, we're, we're obviously very aware of the problems there have been with COVID. And all of the first year material could be done online. There's, there's nothing in that that we couldn't do online. And we, we could certainly run it as a hybrid course if the need arose. Our intention is that it's a course where we're physically with you in Tartu, but if things go otherwise that make that difficult or impossible. And I have to say, I was, I was very pleased that you'd got a Ukrainian flag on the table. And I suppose we have to recognise, you know, it might, the reason for people not being able to travel easily in September might not be because of COVID, but might be because of something else horrible and serious. And and again, we we would be able to to run a large part of the masters on online if, if the need arose. It's not our intention, but we've designed it in such a way that it's possible should the need arise. Thank you very much for answering these questions and also for your flexibility as well, considering current situations with COVID and political situations. Uh, so the next question is also going to be addressed, to, uh, is actually also going to be addressed to clinical nutrition program. Uh, so the question is, what kind of previous experience do I need to have in order to apply uh, for a cl clinical nutrition program? Okay, so I, I didn't say very much about that. We're, we're expecting that everyone will have a bachelor's degree in something healthcare related. And the majority of those people will have done something that is obviously linked to nutrition in some sort of way. A medical degree, of course, someone who's qualified as a nurse or a dietitian, or, or indeed a pharmacist, although perhaps not very many pharmacists, um, but also someone who's come from a more biologically um, based background, who's become interested in the nutritional aspects of, of biology. Um, it might be someone whose interests stem from food science or from agriculture who's got an interest that's drawn them towards human nutrition for one reason or another. So as an absolute requirement for a bachelor's degree, so we're expecting only graduates, that's for sure, but it's that plus an interest. And, and you heard before the importance of the motivational statement for pharmacy, that will also be important for us. We'll, we, we require a motivational statement and an interview. So every, everyone that applies that's eligible will have a, their motivational statement carefully scrutinised and they'll have a, an online interview. So we, we'll, we'll look at that carefully together. And again, as with pharmacy, we're, we're asking for quite a high standard of English. And I... I Find, I, I find it a bit of a challenge, the English aspect, because on the one hand, we want to be as inclusive as possible. We want to bring in people from countries that haven't had so much opportunity for nutrition training. But I've known from my own experiences, particularly in London, that someone who struggles with the language misses out on so much else that they're, you know, they're spending all their time worrying about speaking English and not concentrating on the clinical nutrition. So we also are asking for the C1 standard with um, with English language and honestly that's for the students benefit it, it's it's frustrating for everyone if the student is spending a lot of time worrying about their English so we, we want them to be good at English good enough to be able to communicate without that being the main focus of their anxiety so they can they really concentrate on on the clinical nutrition so so there, there are three three requirements really a bachelor's degree decent English and wanting to do clinical nutrition that's that's the main thing we're after Thank you very much for a so detailed answer. Uh, the next question is addressed to clinical pharmacy. So can I combine work and study uh, while studying clinical pharmacy at the same time? Uh, yes, you can. And, uh, and uh, that's why uh, we have designed our, our um, like, uh, 
uh, how the course is, uh, is built up is, is for those who need to work also uh, during the weekends sometimes. And the webinar is, uh, is like in European time after work. And uh, uh, before we started with the master's program, we have run this course. We're currently running it as, a, as a, just a clinical edu uh, additional educational program. And uh, at the beginning, uh, our main worries were if people are managing uh, to study this uh, during their uh, during uh, the same time they are working. And uh, the good news is that uh, if people are motivated, they manage to do it. Of course, it's hard, but uh, uh, at least the program is only one year plus masters, so it's a hard year. <laughs> but uh, uh, we we have also conducted uh, interviews with our all of our students in the middle of the year. And uh, and the, everybody said it's so interesting uh, that uh, you you can learn afterwards and you can work uh, you can use the things you're learning during your everyday practice. So it means that it's um, it's not something very different that you do. So you can. <laughs> Thank you very much for your answer. Uh, the next question we have uh, uh, to Alastair. Uh, so the question is: Is there an internship uh, for a clinical nutrition program, and if the university helps to find a place to conduct such an internship, if there is one? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes and yes. Uh, so there is an internship. I think it's um, ten weeks, and that that is intended to to be very specifically relevant to the clinical and career needs of, of the student. So what what is most relevant to that student, we we will encourage will certainly help people to find somewhere suitable if they haven't got somewhere already and i think a lot of people will, will already have somewhere in mind in in their own country in their own institution um, but if not will certainly help and as i said our our team of international um, lecturers will also help with that so I've, I've got contacts in just about every country in europe in terms of finding clinical placements and although perhaps not quite so readily accessible i've got contacts around the rest of the world as well and certainly the far east vietnam thailand singapore um, south america brazil colombia north america both canada and the united states so there are lots and lots of places where we've got where we've got strong strong links um, africa is perhaps more of a challenge but i think in that case we would make sure that anyone coming from africa w was found a, a suitable placement um, either in estonia or, or elsewhere in europe Thank you very much. Uh, the next question we can also address to both programs, I guess. Uh, the question is, is it possible to have an exchange semester within the programs? So maybe, Jana, you can start first. So exchange semester is a bit diffi difficult because we have this online uh, online uh, uh, learning. So I think uh, we, we, we don't have that one, I think. So we basically can organize, the, we can help you to find the internship and practice periods in other countries. But uh, I think uh, at the moment, I, I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> All right. Alastair, do yeah, you have I'm, an answer? I'm also not quite sure. I'm not 100% sure what's being asked. Um, is, is this suggestion that someone would do part of their course in another university and would, would swap courses? Was that, was that the intention, do you think? I guess this is related to the Erasmus Plus, uh, Erasmus Exchange yeah. or... Well, obviously, all, all of our modules are ECTs, so in that sense, they are transferable. Um, I don't know. I, I, I wouldn't encourage it because our, our course is designed as a, as a complete course. But if, let's say, someone was particularly interested in a particular type of clinical nutrition and they said, look, you know, the, uh, half the things in the first year are actually irrelevant to me and I want to do more, I don't know, I, I suppose some, maybe a vet. Um, who is very interested in clinical nutrition, but not particularly interested in the things that apply to people, but finds quite a lot in our programme that would be of interest, but also wants to do a lot of stuff that's specific to animals. I suppose we, we could customise it, work, work with our own veterinary school in Tartu, and, and work out some modules that would be more suitable, that would allow... So we could do it. I mean, it's, it's not been set up with that intention, but if there was someone with particular needs or someone who was already closely engaged in an academic environment somewhere else that wanted to do courses that were impossible for us to offer, yeah, I suppose so. I, I mean, I think that's one of those things where you'd need to look at it individually, but 
my approach would always be to be very flexible and clearly it would have to comply with the university regulations but they are ECTs so they are transferable by their very nature um, so yes it, it's possible it's not something we've particularly been thinking about but if someone comes with a particular set of issues this is important for me I'd like to do your master's course but that wouldn't work for me well we could work on it I and mean, we could we could sort it through with the admissions office with the university regulations and and whichever other institution was providing the other material so yeah we could we could do that thank you very much for your answer as we could see there is a lot of flexibility involved so this is really great uh, the next question is addressed to clinical pharmacy so how do courses look alike are your classes lecture based or discussion based yeah like i already shortly described uh, it's uh, the structure is uh, similar for all the topics and it's divided into study weeks uh, the, the learning is divided into study weeks and it starts for with your own uh, homework so you can look uh, read uh, materials and uh, and we have electronic lectures which are recorded and uh, and then you uh, basically like every week you do the similar things to which support your learning different activities and uh, basically the only time you need to be available and online is uh, is webinar which is once weekly and uh, and uh, otherwise uh, it's it's you, you can organize your, your time thank you very much uh, we have another question which is uh, addressed to clinical nutrition program uh, can I work after graduation in Estonia if I don't speak Estonian? <laughs> hey <there. laughs> um, the, the, the master's is, is not that sort of a professional qualification that it allows you to be something afterwards. It doesn't make you into a dietitian. So, so in, in the sense of a, of a degree giving a, a, a professional qualification, no, it doesn't. Um, could you work in Estonia? Yes, of course you could. And Estonia is actually a very welcoming country in that regard. It's, it's a country that, that's keen to have um, immigrants and particularly people who are academic, scientifically orientated. So it's a welcoming environment from that point of view. Could you do it without speaking Estonian? Well, yeah, you can. I, I've been doing that myself. I'm trying very hard. and I, I am learning Estonian. Um, I've given a few lectures in Estonian now, but it's jolly hard. Um, but... I don't need to be able to speak Estonian to be able to do my job uh, because th there are so many people. Um, most young people in Estonia speak very good English and it's it's never a problem communicating. I um, mean, occasionally you're, you'll find someone that doesn't speak English but instantly someone who does appears from around the corner. So if you speak English or Russian, being in Estonia without speaking Estonian is, is not a particularly big problem, but and I wouldn't recommend it. I mean, as I say, I'm trying very hard myself. And I think, you know, you should always try and speak the language where, where you are. But but in order to function and in order to work, there are, there are plenty of work environments. I know through talking to the parents of, of the other children in my boys' school, there, there are lots of Estonians who spend their entire working life working in English. And one of his best friends has a German father, and he he actually speaks extremely good Estonian, but his working life is not in Estonian, it's not in German, it's in English, because his company has, is a multinational company and he has people from all over. And and that's, that's also true in the healthcare setting. It, it's obviously more of a problem if whatever you do relates to patients, because... You know, you can expect other staff, um, other university people, they will speak English, they'll speak Russian, but you can't really expect the patients to speak another language. So, so if, if what you want to do is, is patient orientated, then I think Estonian becomes very important. Thank you very much. Jana, what about your programme? Our program, uh, I think uh, if you are a pharmacist who has a degree that Estonia recognizes and you have a clinical pharmacist degree, then you are welcome. <laughs> again, about the language, uh, it's uh, uh, again, if you work at the community pharmacy, you have to speak Estonian. And also at the hospital, probably you have to speak Estonian uh, if you talk with the patients. Uh, same, same probably uh, what uh, Professor Astel said. Thank you. Uh, the next question is again to you. What are the admission requirements for clinical pharmacy? Yes, we have, uh, uh, you have to have the C1 level in English 
you have to have a master's degree in pharmacy or uh, equal uh, uh, level uh, from from another other country mm, or from Estonia and you have to write the motivation letter and have an interview with us and and that's that's all we have and I must say that uh, it's we, we are ready for in very international students at the moment we have one uh, student from Hong Kong and it's really working well at it's uh, it's um, the language is for us also the main question that has been asked but again the C1 is necessary to focus thank you very much I guess we have managed to answer all of the questions that we were asked thank you very much for being today with us if you have still have questions after this session you are welcome to email directly to Jana or to Alastair so they will help you with your questions and don't forget about the admission deadline that is coming on the 15th of March so if you would like to join the University of Tartu and specifically these two new programs in clinical pharmacy and clinical nutrition then please uh, don't forget to apply submit all of your documents and if you have any questions please also contact our admission office thank you very much for joining us today and uh, stay with us uh, we are going to continue with the next uh, session soon thanks thank you <laughs>
And we are continuing our open doors uh, with our next info session, which is dedicated to natural sciences, first part. And today with me, I have uh, Anu, who is going to introduce two programs, Applied Measurement Science and Excellence in Analytical Chemistry. So during the session, I would like to remind you that you have also a wonderful opportunity to leave your questions and then we will answer them online. So you can see if you are joining us from workshop, you can see that next to each info session, there is a Q&A button and you can just leave your question there and then we will answer you online. And then uh, we also have a uh, Facebook and YouTube stream and you can also ask your questions there. But uh, if you want them to be answered live, then please join the workshop. Uh, so all in all, let's uh, maybe start with our presentations. And Anna today is going to present in two presentations in a row. Uh, so let's learn more about applied measurement science and excellence in analytical chemistry. So Anu, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, I am Anu and uh, as already introduced, uh, I have two programs that are coordinated by the Institute of Chemistry and at the University of Tartu. So I will start with applied measurement science and I will first uh, explain why measurements are important. So measurement uh, results are used uh, for many critical decisions, uh, whether in uh, economics or medical or, or social and then roughly 40% of EU directives are involved measurements and then the need for measurements uh, uh, and importance of measurement results is constantly increasing so the main issues here in this area are the uh, increasing number and uh, and variety of measurements and tests needed and uh, at the same time lack of skilled specialists so the key to success is education so we need to have some kind of uh, programs that uh, aim to qualify specialists in areas uh, related to measurement science and, and quality assurance and things like that. And the applied measurement science master program does exactly that. So it's a, a program that combines different aspects, physical measurements, uh, chemical analysis, quality management uh, and uh, metrology, and also touches on economic, legal and social aspects of these these uh, disciplines and it's a, a two-year master program 120 ECTS that has courses in chemistry physics um, measurement science data handling data management and also includes internship or practical placement and in addition to this it also has a, a mobility window built into it so it the program encourages students to go abroad, study abroad for a semester. And there is also this possibility to add uh, measurement science in chemistry summer school and uh, massive open online courses uh, into the curriculum. Uh, a very important question. Will you find a job after graduating the AMS uh, program? And the answer is yes. So. Uh, the specialist that the program uh, or, or pro provides then is uh, are needed in areas uh, uh, that are very broad. So main, mainly they work in labs, uh, in governmental or 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 scientific labs, and uh, also they they work in. Uh, quality assurance field and also as um, engineers and also a very popular options am option among our alumni is uh, continuing their studies in PhD level. And uh, some technicalities about the program. So the tuition fee for the program is 5,000 euros per year 
and there are few scholarship options uh, available. So there is DORA Plus Action 2.1 to fund your studies and during your studies you have the access to Erasmus Plus Mobility Scholarship for Credit Mobility and Traineeship and also achievement uh, and need based uh, stipends are, are available. And how to apply for this program? The deadline is uh, March 15 and uh, for entry you must have bachelor's degree uh, or you can also graduate during the summer <laughs> and uh, the prerequisite is that you have 18, 18 ECTS worth of uh, uh, courses in chemistry or physics and also English uh, language requirements uh, are listed on the link, uh, the first link on, the, on this slide. And the ev evaluation or ranking is based on two um, things. So first your average grade of the previous study level and also motivation letter is taken into account. And more details about the application and also how to apply is uh, provided uh, under the link uh, on the bottom of this slide. So you can read more. And this brings me to our next program that we have in the Institute of Chemistry, the Excellence in Analytical Chemistry, that is an Erasmus Mundus uh, joint master's degree program coordinated by the University of Tartu and involves also Uppsala University, uh, Claude Bernard, uh, Leon I uh, University and Oba Academy University. And this program is specifically designed to qualify specialists in analytical chemi chemistry and is very practice oriented. But first let's look uh, if, there is also, uh, if there is a need for analytical chemists. So uh, as you can see from this, uh, or this graph shows then the recent uh, graduates of uh, different chemistry disciplines in Europe and uh, the orange bars then represent uh, uh, job market needs and as you can see the gap between uh, uh, analyt uh, chem chemist or analytical chemistry specialists uh, and uh, the job market uh, actual needs is uh, one of the biggest here. So yes, definitely we need more analytical chemists. <laughs> and uh, this is why we have excellence in analytical chemistry program. And the program is uh, uh, run by uh, four European universities. And uh, during your first year, you will study at the University of Tartu, the coordinating uh, university. and. Uh, this year is uh, aimed to give you knowledge about fundamentals in analytical chemistry, metrology and uh, quality assurance, but also in socio-economical aspects. And the first year also will prepare you for your second study year at uh, one of the three partner universities. So uh, for Uppsala University, the specialization is in organic and bioorganic chemistry. Uh, in advanced separation methods and mass spectrometry. In University uh, Claude Bernard Lyon 1, you will uh, uh, specialize in in industrial analysis, process control and monitoring. And in Oba Academy University, uh, you will specialize in advanced uh, analytical devices, sensors and miniaturization. A uh, very important part of the, each program is uh, selection for the study tracks or assignment for your second study year. And this is done at the end of uh, first semester. And uh, uh, the first thing that uh, counts is the student's uh, preference. And if needed, also their uh, GPA of the obligatory courses from the first semester is taken into account. And the final decision is made during the winter school at the end of semester one. So 
by the second semester you will already know where you will study during your second study year. So other activities uh, like the AMS program, uh, the, each program also contains different types of courses. So in addition to normal courses, you also have the practical placement or internship that is usually done be between year one and two during the summer. And uh, also a compulsory part of the each program is the winter school that takes place uh, at the end of uh, January uh, uh, in year one and also in year two. And uh, as for the AMS program, you can also include uh, the MS, uh, MSc summer school or MOOCs into your curriculum. Uh, again, will you find a job after graduating? Yes, uh, so uh, the success story of the each program is uh, uh, quite, quite good. So 86% uh, of our graduates have found a position within 12 months after graduation. And to be honest, the, uh, quite a lot of them secure a position even, even quick, more quickly or even before they have graduated. And the examples where they work, uh, as what kind of uh, position they get, and then also lo the location where they work is quite impressive. So the, the, our, our graduates are all over the world now, so. <laughs> Uh, the tuition fee uh, for the each program is uh, depends whether your uh, program country students or student or a uh, partner country student. But the details are quite difficult, and so I suggest that you read more about those on the link that is provided on the slide. Uh, the program, as it is a Erasmus Mundus program, offers scholarships that cover your tuition fee, uh, and the tuition fee also includes full insurance, and also have uh, monthly allowances for up to 24 months, uh, travel allowance twice per year, uh, twice per program, sorry, and then uh, if applicable also installation allowance uh, once per program. And uh, uh, the program also offers tuition waiver scholarship that cover only tuition fee. Uh, how to apply for this program? Well, uh, for this year, the application round has already finished. Uh, so uh, uh, the next round uh, for intake 2023 then will open in the first half of November. And for admission, you will need a bachelor's degree with at least 60 CTS in chemistry and, uh, or, or, or chemical engineering, and also 20 ECTS in mathematics and or physics. And also English is required. But the list of requirements is quite long, so I, I suggest that you have a look at the link that is provided on this slide. And the ranking is uh, based on three elements. So the average grade of the previous study level is taken into account, the motivation letter, and also we have an uh, online test for uh, of pro uh, some chemical problems that you have to solve. And uh, uh, currently the admission information applies for intake 2022. We will update the uh, web page uh, somewhere in September or early October, but overall the, the, the admission requirements will remain similar to the ones that are presented at, uh, at the web page at the moment. And finally, I will just uh, briefly show you the study locations and also uh, uh, show you the people you can contact. So the home uh, for these two programs is the Institute of Chemistry on the University of Tartu or Chemicum. It's a rather new building. It opened in 2009. It provides uh, students with modern lecture rooms and uh, very nicely equipped labs. 
And next to it, we have Physicum, the Institute of Physics and the University of Tartu, that is even uh, a newer building. It uh, opened in 2014. So, so the, the teaching facilities are among the top in Europe. The academic coordinator of those programs is Professor Ivo Leito, and uh, he is most knowledgeable in all the academic questions. So if you have questions about the curriculum, the courses, uh, the internship uh, and stuff like that, then you can turn to him. He's, he's very responsive. <laughs> I am the administrative coordinator of those programs and I, you can turn to me when you have questions about uh, scholarships or insurance or Erasmus Plus uh, mobility. So just send me an email. <laughs> and lastly, our colleagues at Study Abroad Centre are always very happy to answer your question up questions about visas, resident permits, travel to Estonia, dormitory, and so on. So, thank you, and I hope to meet you all in Tartu very soon. Thank you very much, Anu, for presenting two of your programs <laughs> and for providing a very detailed overview about the programs, career opportunities, and also providing the uh, information about the buildings where actually the studies take place. And I also would like to point out that on Wednesday we are going to have online tours in this building. So those people who are interested to see how these buildings look like inside, I welcome you to join us on Wednesday and to see uh, them inside as well. Very nice. So right now, I guess we can open our Q&A session and we have quite some questions that arrived. Aha, <laughs> so uh, let's start then from the first one. Uh, thanks for the session. Could you give us an idea about the process of completing a year or a semester abroad after joining Tartu University? Is that case, do we need to pay the tuition fees in Tartu or just at the hosting university? Thank you. So you will be a student of University of Tartu for the whole study time. So regardless where you actually study, you will be a student of University of Tartu. And yes, you have to pay the fees to the University of Tartu then. So uh, yeah, you will not be... In case of AMS, you will count as an a exchange student for the other university in case of each it's a bit different but basically you will, on the on the second study year you will be on the two universities then you will be also accepted to the second year university it's a bit different so <laughs> yeah it's a little bit different but with still yeah. university of tartu is the one who will get <laughs> then the tuition fee and then then we will provide the partner <laughs> Yeah, definitely it's going to be a little bit different from, for excellence in, analytic, yes. in chemistry because uh, uh, the second year students supposed to stay abroad. Yes. So uh, probably, I don't know if you would recommend to actually take an exchange year during the first year. Uh, no, uh, it's a very specific program and the first year is uh, meant to kind of prepare you for your second uh, year for your specialization so you you will get your mobility already so uh, it's yeah, nice to have yeah, some time it, in Tartu it, as yeah, well yeah. yeah and this is something that I uh, that our uh, each alumni also point out that uh, during the first year they didn't think of traveling in Estonia and that is the I think one thing that they regret the most <laughs> Because they come here to study and then focus and during the second year they then discover that oh we can travel. <laughs> so yeah, enjoy Tartu as well. <laughs> yes, our next session is also dedicated to student experience and we have uh, students from both of the programs. So you can also stay with us and they will tell you more how mm -hmm. these studies are conducted and how much travel they can do or if they are forgetting to travel and then regretting <laughs> once they are moving to another country. Uh, so, Anna, I know that you have been uh, talking already about career opportunities, but there is a question, where can I work after graduating applied measurement science? 
So we, we've, unfortunately, we do not have a very nice uh, statistic about the plate, applied measurement science as we do for the each program. But uh, many of our graduates have uh, found a job uh, here in Estonia. So they're working in different labs here or also under the government as um, uh, in some legal offices and advisors uh, for European Commission or something. So. Uh, it's quite broad, um, or, or the field w where you can work is quite broad. But but yeah, it's I'd say it's roughly 50-50. So uh, a lot of them continue in PhD, a lot of them continue here at the University of Tartu, or or choose another university in Estonia. Uh, but also a lot of them yeah have found the uh, jobs in in various labs in Estonia. So most of the graduates are staying in Estonia or? Uh, I would say yes, that uh, in recent years maybe they have uh, our, our locations uh, have also broadened, but, uh, but up to now, yes, a lot of them remained in Estonia as well. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> um, then we have a question about internship. So I assume that there is a lot of practical trainings within both of the programs. So the question is, is the internship compulsory? Does the university help to find a place to conduct an internship? Yes, uh, the internship is compulsory and the university helps to find a placement. It's pretty difficult, but we have a nice list of partners and each year the academic coordinator does a great job in securing positions and uh, when we know who is ready to take the uh, students then then the students can uh, then s start sending out emails and then the the professor al always uh, uh, guides and then helps uh, to to negotiate the, those positions so are there cases that the students are conducting internship at the University of Tartu or mostly outside? Uh, we prefer them going outside. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's uh, possible if you find a placement for yourself, it's okay to do, but uh, we know it's difficult to find. So, and it doesn't have to be in Estonia, it can be outside of Estonia. So uh, we also, we also, it's very popular to go outside during the summer. <laughs> so, uh, but, uh, uh, we a few students also prefer staying in our labs and doing it there. But if you have the chance to go outside, then I say go and see what what the real lab work is about. So yeah, then why not to try different labs yes. and even try and like have an internship abroad is a very good yes. opportunity. We we have uh, we have a very good uh, Erasmus uh, uh, Plus office and, and very nice people over there and they uh, so it's a very popular option as well. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so I guess the next question is addressed to actually excellence in analytical chemistry program. Mm -hmm. The question is about uh, a problem solving test. Mm -hmm. So what uh, this test uh, what does online test on problem solving include? Uh, can you tell us more about it? I assume it is a part of the admission criteria to the program. Yes, yes, it's uh, uh, one of the criteria to, um, or one of the three, and uh, it's a very popular question as well. But unfortunately, I cannot tell much about it because it 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 gives an uh, advantage then. Uh, but it's normal chemi chemistry related problems and then uh, calculations mainly. So you don't have to, you don't have to go on uh, answering some theory questions or something. So it's, you have to calculate. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for opening some small secrets. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, the next question is actually um, about the difference between excellence in analytical chemistry and applied measurement science. So I assume mm. the applicant uh, is choosing between these two programs and mm. trying to figure out which program would would be better for mm -hmm. him or her. Yes, uh, thank you. This is very good question. And uh, these programs, uh, we call them sister programs. They're they seem to be very similar, 
But uh, the main difference is that analytical excellence in analytical chemistry is uh, uh, totally um, or aimed at uh, qualifying only analytical chemists. So you will learn uh, how to measure, but you will learn it from only the chemistry perspective. Uh, applied measurement science is a bit broader, so um, measurements, it's not always only chemistry, so it's metrology in, uh, in broader terms, and it involves more physics and also data handling and, and uh, things like that. All right, thank you very much. I hope uh, you will be able oh, yes, now to I pick <laughs> I managed to. <laughs> between two programs. Uh, so the next question is, it seems that the application deadline for excellence in analytical, analytical chemistry is over. Mm -hmm. Does it mean that I cannot apply for the next academic year? And when can I apply? Mm. Yes, the, de uh, the admission for the each program runs uh, on different times uh, as the AMS program because it's an Erasmus Mundus program and it has a lot more steps compared to our own programs. Uh, so uh, the deadline passed uh, at January 11, so yes, for this year the there is no way we can include any any applicants anymore. But uh, the next uh, application round will open in uh, November 2022, and then you're all welcome to apply for it. Thank you very much. Maybe it also will help to the applicant who is choosing between two programs. Yes. So if the applicant would like to join like from next academic year, then uh, mm -hmm. maybe applied measurement science uh, would be would be closer than yeah uh, could be and if any questions remain then yeah our academic coordinator and i you can email or send us messages and then we will reply <laughs> gladly <laughs> We have another question regarding admission process. So uh, applicants are asking, is there admission interview? If yes, then what questions should we expect? No, we don't have the admission interview. So for the AMS program, we only have the motivation letter and then the GPA from the previous study level. And for the, for the each program, it also has the problem solving test then. Yeah, we don't do interviews. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so how do courses look alike? Are your courses more lecture-based or discussion-based? Uh, how much uh, theoretical and practical knowledge uh, um, students get? It depends very much on the lecturer, but I, I would say that our lectures usually are more discussion-based, so the, the Teachers uh, like to reflect on the classroom and then the use different type of uh, teaching methods. And also group works are very, very um, popular among the teachers. And, uh, and as far as I know, our teachers are very encouraging in uh, getting the students to discuss about problems. Which is really very, great. Very accommodating to questions. So. Yeah. I have another question about admissions. What average GPA should GPA should I have in order to apply? Did not specify the program, so maybe we can uh, uh, we can take two both programs? Yeah, I would say the higher the better. <laughs> so uh, one thing that you have to note is that uh, the each program usually uh, has a very tough competition for obvious reasons. So the scholarships are uh, very, uh, how to say, the high. Yeah, high demand. And then we, we get very, very good applications each year. Uh, what you need to note is that uh, in order to be eligible for the EU scholarship or the Erasmus Mundus scholarship, you, you need to have at least 75% of the final score from 100. So, uh, and, and your general GPA will give you 40% maximum from this score. So uh, the, 
yeah, I would say the higher the better, <laughs> because it's uh, it's one of the bigger elements in your final score. So, and uh, for AMS program, uh, I think it was 66% of the final score was was uh, needed to uh, 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 get admission at least. Mm -hmm. So it's it's dif different. Yeah. yeah, the higher the better. So yes. let's sum up. <laughs> I would say yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, so we have another question about the uh, uh, admission to excellence in analytical chemistry. Mm -hmm. uh, so the question is, uh, uh, I'm from non-European Union country. Mm -hmm. How can I get a scholarship? So uh, uh, the Erasmus Mundus program will uh, provide 75% uh, scholarships to non-EU mm -hmm. students and then 25% will go to EU students or program students, sorry. Uh, so uh, the world for us is divided into program and partner country and uh, most of the scholarships are then uh, given out to students from outside EU, UK, uh, Switzerland uh, and uh, Serbia and Turkey and um, North Macedonia and something there was one more country <laughs> so basically uh, 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 the partner country uh, the students will get more scholarships or, or we have more scholarships for them and um, yeah you just have to apply for the program and we provide us with information where you're from and then we we will already divide you into two groups and then yeah and also probably pay attention on the academic background and all of, all of yes, the documents the, it, that should be the, required the admission process for the each program is uh, more comprehensive than for the applied measurement science program. So the list of documents that you need to provide is quite long and uh, and uh, yeah, you, you need to invest in it, but uh, if you're successful, then the rewards are quite nice. <laughs> Thank you very much. So we have quite uh, some several questions about the motivation letters. Mm -hmm. so maybe you can comment uh, about motivation letters for both programs and what kind of motivation letter do you expect to actually mm -hmm. uh, select a successful applicant for the program? So maybe mm -hmm. some to you some mm -hmm. ideas or some uh, questions that needs to be uh, that need to be answered so um, for both programs we have a short um, overview of what we expect from the motivation letter and uh, uh, for the applied measurement science program it's a bit I, I don't want to say easier but uh, more straightforward you you need to just show your willingness to or or your interest in studying is in this field so you kind of just need to show this but for the each program there are uh, five different uh, uh, subcategories that we that we want to see uh, one of them being uh, your study tr track preferences so you you have to also uh, uh, answer the questions why you choose some kind of study track so uh, maybe maybe uh, the best advice is to just go to the uh, both of those web pages and then just see what we are looking for. But uh, what I have seen so far is that uh, the motivation letter uh, usually. How to say then? It, you, if you get the idea of the program, then, then the motivation is also there. 
Yes. Thank you very much for commenting on that because many people, of course, uh, yes, would like to produce a very good motivation letter <laughs> yes. to be on the top ranking. So mm -hmm. these tips are very useful. Yeah. Yes. Again, it's a bigger part of, uh, of the admission criteria, yes. of course, so because if there is no interview, so basically your motivation yeah, letter. That, this has to be the, your interview. Then. Yes. So try to so. think that uh, how, how you can show that you're very, very interested in this program. <laughs> so uh, thank you. Our next question, uh, what is the acceptance rate for individuals applying for uh, both programs? That's difficult to say. <laughs> That's very difficult to say. <laughs> it depends on a lot of things. <laughs> so uh, we we usually have, um, f for example, for this year we have for the each program we have um, around twenty five positions, and sixteen uh, of them are then the Erasmus Mundi scholarship places, and uh, we also have tuition waiver places available, and uh, and some some of them are then uh, fee based pay, uh, spaces. For the AMS program, I think it was ten. <laughs> I, uh, it's too many numbers, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Uh, but it's also possible to check it on the website because yes, on our program the, uh, pages we have the number of yeah, places for is, each program. This is available and uh, usually, um, I don't want to say that we don't have that many applications, but uh, as the criteria are quite uh, specific, then uh, yes, the, let's say the competition war for one place isn't that high. Mm -hmm. Maybe this is then will help <laughs> encourage you to apply still. <laughs> yes, I have another question about uh, excellence in analytical chemistry. Mm -hmm. So the question is about the uh, choosing the speciality. Mm -hmm. uh, does applicant need to choose or a student already need to choose the speciality during the first year? So it's already like the fate is decided and the, he or she will go to France or Sweden or Finland or how is it uh, uh, actually, how is it happening? Mm -hmm. So for the second study year, you have to go abroad. So this is how the program works. So first year is done at Tartu and then the second year you will do your specialization and thesis work at the second location. But uh, we ask from the applicants already, uh, there are two um, preferences. And then uh, during the semester, we have seminars with uh, second year students, with uh, alumni, uh, Q&A sessions with them. So this uh, first year students can have, uh, can ask all the questions that they have about the second year and all the, uh, I mean, whatever questions about life, about travel. So, and uh, by the end of the first semester, by the end of January, you will have to then decide what do you want to do during your second year? And then the decision is made the, at the end of uh, first semester. And during the second semester, you can already uh, start uh, focusing on uh, going abroad. So there are special courses for each study track at Tartu as well. So you can prepare in advance. <laughs> so. But, but yeah, there, there is no option to delay it more. <laughs> I have also uh, one question which is related to this one. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, about motivation letter and if the applicant should also indicate uh, what kind of path he or she would like to take uh, um, in the second year, so uh, the specialization wise. Yes, one of the points that we ask in the motivation letter for the each program is uh, Actually, we want to list two preferences. So preference number one and preference number two. Uh, so these are included in the motivation letter. So at the beginning, you already can show your, your preferences.
Thank you very much. I have another question about internship uh, at mm -hmm. the Excellence in Analytical Chemistry program. Mm -hmm. Is the inter internship available and uh, how can I choose my internship place? So from um, right after the winter school and year one, uh, at the beginning of the second semester, our professor starts sending out emails to companies, to labor laboratories and other facilities uh, about uh, internship options. And then uh, uh, I think around March, the students then can start sending uh, emails to the available places. But um, I, I will just mention one uh, option for the each program as well. So students going to Lyon uh, will have a final semester at the industry. So this will count as internship for them. So if if needed, then uh, the students uh, assigned to Lyon study track uh, do not have to do the uh, internship during the summer. They can skip it and then do it during the last semester as their as their master thesis work. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I have another question about master's thesis at Applied Measurement Science. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could name some of the um, um, examples of uh, master thesis uh, which are usually students uh, writing at the department. Maybe it will give a better overview so what uh, a student can write about or maybe you can direct to the website where it is uh, uh, they can find this information as well. Yeah, um, I can't name any specific topics i'm very sorry uh, because there is a lot of topics each year uh, for me uh, but uh, yes the web page has some overview about the uh, topics or areas that the uh, students have uh, done their thesis work and i know that our students have uh, dealt with different problems so there was one student who analyzed honey and uh, and then there there are other students that uh, analyze some biological uh, uh, organic matter mm -hmm. in in soil and, and the, the topics vary <laughs> so yeah thank you very much yes and please turn to the website and there yes. you will find the information as well or stay with us uh, mm -hmm. uh, for the next session and we will have students maybe also yeah. they have some ideas what they're going to write about because yes. they're already studying yeah they are already they are already doing their master's thesis at least uh, one of them should be <laughs> Yes, I have one more uh, admission related uh, mm -hmm. question. So are there any prerequisite courses uh, from the bachelor's degree to apply to applied measurement science? Uh, you only need to have uh, at least uh, 20 ECTS of uh, chemistry or physics courses. So this is the only prerequisite for, for applying for this program. So if you... Uh, the the courses will or your how to say your uh, transcript will be evaluated for the, the the admission office will count if you have enough chemistry or physics but uh, if you are in doubt then you can already send an email to our academic coordinator professor leto and uh, he can give you not the official opinion. The official opinion will be given after after submitting your documents uh, for the admission. But uh, he he will provide some some insight to it already. Mm -hmm. Another question regarding scholarships. So, mm -hmm. are there a scholarship for applied measurement science? So. Uh, the, the situation for the applied measurement science regarding scholarship is not that nice compared to the each program. There, there are very limited options. So one of them is uh, DORA plus. But uh, we have had students coming from uh, outside Estonia with their own governmental uh, scholarships. But yeah, unfortunately, the, the, the scholarships provided for the AMS program are not that, uh, not that uh, great. I'm sorry to say. <laughs> Thank you for your answer. Um, the next question is more related to uh, the amount of practical work that mm -hmm. should be done within the program. 
which is not indicated which program. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but I assume there is a lot of practical work in labs uh, uh, required, mm -hmm. of course. So, yes, they are both very practice oriented uh, courses. Uh, uh, the AMS program contains labs in uh, chemistry and physics. And the, each program uh, mainly has chemistry labs. Uh, during the first semester, you will not have that much access to the labs. Uh, you, this is the semester that you have to get acquainted with the university and that's why. But in, in the spring, there will be more lab courses and a very intensive lab course that uh, in analytical chemistry so yeah. i would say uh, quite enough <laughs> you should expect a lot of practice and a lot of time spending in the lab yes, yes. Uh, 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 one day per week in in the lab at least <laughs> <laughs> I have also another question regarding admissions about admission criteria for applied measurement science. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think you have mentioned during your presentation about that, but what is taken into account when you are selecting applicants for the program? Mm -hmm. Yes, the applied measurement science uh, looks at the GPA from the previous study level, from the bachelor level then, and then uh, uh, the motivation letter will be graded and um, the GPA and the motivation letter grade, they have the same weight. So it's 50-50 then. Yeah. Thank you very much. I can't see questions anymore and it, it's been quite a lot of questions. And uh, thank you very much for answering for both programs because it was like yeah. quite, <laughs> quite a lot, let's say. But yes, uh, please remember to, if you want to apply to applied measurement size, science, please remember the deadline of 15th of March. Don't miss the deadline and apply and join us already next academic year. Mm -hmm. And then if you would like to apply to our another program in excellence in, uh, excellence in analytical chemistry, then please uh, start your application already in November. Yes, exactly. So it's a, it's a dif different timing, so be prepared be prepared and thank you for all the questions and thank you for joining. Thank you for being with us. Uh, thank you for listening to our presentations. We hope that uh, uh, you got answers to your questions today. And uh, I also would like to invite you to the next session, which is going to be conducted with students from the same program. So the students are going to talk about their experience of studying, living in Estonia, even relocation from their own countries to Estonia, how, we, how it was for them and how the studies are going, what kind of of uh, amount of uh, uh, work they have every day, how much time they should in lab. So all of this we are going to discuss uh, during our next session. So please don't miss it. Maybe you also can find uh, uh, some uh, students that you can later uh, contact if you have some questions about life. So this is going to be very useful and will give you like more bigger overview about these two wonderful programs that are looking to for you to apply. <laughs> so thank you very much and uh, see you soon. Stay with us.
Hello everyone and welcome to our discussion session from uh, the University of Tartu with the students from Natural Sciences. My name is uh, Livio, I am an international student ambassador at the University of Tartu and today we're going to have a very fruitful discussion with three of our students. Um, and before um, going further, I would like to announce you that you may leave your questions uh, in the workshop platform. Uh, you may find a Q&A button to each, and to each separate um, session. So uh, if you have any question, please uh, ask it uh, on this space. And if you see a question that uh, has already been uh, asked, please rate it so it will uh, come up and uh, it will uh, be here to, to be addressed. So, uh, without any further ado, uh, I would like to present uh, my guests, Hazar, uh, Zainab and uh, Faisal, all students from Natural Sciences. So, um, first of all, Hazar, could you tell a little bit about yourself? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so my name is Hazar, but people here in uh, Tartu call me Hazi. I'm a master's student of um, excellence in analytical chemistry. Um, currently, I'm in my second semester here in Tartu. Yeah, and also I'm from the Philippines. Yes, very, very far. Cool, thank you. Uh, Zainab? Um, hello, uh, I'm Zainab and uh, I'm master's student uh, first year and second semester and uh, I'm studying applied measurement science and I come from IRA. Cool. And uh, Faisal? Hello. I'm Faisal. I'm actually from Bangladesh. And I am doing here my master's in second years. And I'm also from the same program, Applied Measurement Science. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you so much for, for coming. Um, now, the first thing that I think is on the uh, minds of everyone is, what do you like the most about the University of Tartu from your experience so far? Uh, Faisal? If you ask me about uh, what I like, first of all, I will say that like when I choose my curriculum, then I go through the programs and the subjects which I actually like the most. And secondly, when I joined the program and I started learning here, so I get like so many knowledge in my practical life. Like we have like lots of practical classes and those things, and we have learned so many analytical chemistry instruments, which was really nice for me. And I really like it because whoever my professors and my teacher was, and they were really grateful. Actually, they helps us a lot to learn, and that's the main thing I like here most. Cool, thank you. Uh, Zainab, you're from the same program. What do you think? Is it the same for you? Uh, yeah, yes, it's the same. Actually, uh, our professors are really helpful and the atmosphere uh, in the in Chemicom is really friendly. You can talk to your professor whenever you want mm -hmm. because they are al al always approachable. And yeah, I, I, I agree with him. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And Hazar, what do you... Can you say about your program and your experience? Uh, <laughs> what can I say? Well, um, first thing, um, maybe the experience of being um, in a university environment with lots of international students, It's the environment is very stimulating. And the teachers are and the professors are very supportive in our um, uh, endeavors, like whatever we want to do. like. Um, encourage us to not just also focus on our um, studies, but also do some other activities, which I think the university is also promoting. So the students could have a um, well-balanced uh, work, uh, school life and also social life. Yeah. Cool. So balance is the key word here. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so um, was there anything that you didn't expect when you first came to Estonia and well, we first came to the University of Tartu. If you can name one thing that you didn't expect, uh, Hazar. The weather, I would say. <laughs> first <laughs> off, I, I remember, like, because coming from a really tropical country, like, I was kind of thinking, I had this a different impression of what could the autumn semester would look like. And the first thing when I came out of the airport was the first thing I said is like, ooh, it's free <laughs> it's freezing. Uh, yeah, and so 
I mean, it's good. It's a good. It's just unusual for us, and it took us some time, I guess, to get used to it. Yeah. And now, yeah. So winter. was the same for you, Faisal? Uh, actually, I have also another things, and I was not expecting like that when I was here in Estonia and Tartu to first. Then I was not expecting that everyone understand English and can communicate with English. I thought like, okay, they have like their own language and they will communicate with them, but. Anyhow, like whenever I go for like super shops and anywhere and I communicate with the people and they speak English to me. So that was unexpected for me, actually. Good. And what about you, Zainab? Uh, about, uh, since uh, Estonia is a cold country, uh, everybody told me that um, the people there, they are not warm and friendly and like that. And But people in Estonia, they are really nice and they really like to um communicate with even international students and foreigners yeah mm-hmm. yes uh, well, yeah and something yeah, like I, I i also remember like with what you said with uh, estonians being nice like the first thing when i came to like gr- a grocery here when i was paying at the cash register there was this uh, estonian girl who just hugged me for no reason i was like it's like a warm welcome mm-hmm. i guess yeah that's <laughs> Which is, really sweet it was kind of like a shock for me at first like what is happening but <laughs> yeah i mean welcome to estonia i guess yes well estonia is quite welcoming and surprising in a good way mm-hmm. um, now when it comes to your programs what is the one thing that people should know about it why would um, prospective students or our viewers uh, want to uh, seek when applying to this program mm, zainab and I think um, it uh, from my experience mm-hmm. because um, I studied physics, but uh, my program is related to both physics and chemistry. Uh, I think they uh, they had to, they have to know that uh, it's mostly chemistry. So think about that they have to have a good background of chemistry. Yeah. Mm. I will say like this: like if someone is passionate about chemistry, then they should definitely apply, and also. Not like that, like if someone is from others' background, they cannot apply. I am also from others' background, but like anyhow I applied because this course was really interesting. And the main thing is that you will learn so many instruments which will really helpful in your work life. Maybe when you will be working in real life in some laboratory, these courses, like these instruments which you learn from here, this program, it will be really helpful. So I will suggest if anyone wants to like do their career in like these laboratory institutions and others or like research, then they should definitely apply for this program. Okay, good advice. And Isar? Yeah, um, I would say with our, the each program, it's very uh, intensive when it comes to analytical chemistry. And if you, uh, if students would like to get immersed in this environment where you do a lot, lots of experiments, lots of chemical analysis in the laboratory, and if you would have to experience, you would want to experience like operating different instruments, for, like mass spectrometers and um, chromatographs, like the ones that you use typically for um, chemical analysis. And if you also have um, not a a so-so experience before, like with your bachelors when it comes to instrumentation, this is a perfect program because you would get to experience all of those here. Okay, well, it already sounds fun in the way you you guys describe your programs. Um, Is there any favorite course that uh, you feel attached the most in your programs? Uh, Zainab? Um, My favorite course, I think, is the practical uh, work in uh, physicum. That is, um, that you have, it's the lab work and you have to work with all the equipment. And I uh, always like to work in a practical session, so uh, I like it the most, I think, yeah. What about you, Faisal? I have, like, some several courses which are actually favorite of mine but uh, I like the most is like the practical which I did in like chemicum and we had like one practical work which is like six credits and it's really big and we learned around nine practical that time and it was very interesting for me because like I was like new to those instruments and I really liked them and I learned from that that's why it was really interesting for me mm-hmm. good and Azar. My favorite, uh, <laughs> it's like, can I say, like, 
all courses are yeah, sure. equal in weight for me. Yeah, and so like with our previous semester, I would say my uh, favorite was with chemometrics because um, chemometrics is very, um, if you guys are into um, very intensive uh, data analysis, statistics, mathematics, like really understanding how uh, the results of your um, chemical analysis work and how to infer something out of those data, then chemometrics is definitely a good, good course. And um, also another, like it's not just about like chemistry, like you could also have uh, with each you you would also have other modules like uh, there's this socio economic module where um, we were also we would also have to learn like practical aspects. So for example, I uh, took French language last semester and it was really good. Cool. It's really nice to to hear that and. Um I think all the folks back home and all the people are watching us, uh, they're wondering maybe how difficult this program could be for them. So if you could approximate the amount of work that you do, let's say, outside your courses, how much would that be? Uh, Faisal? Okay. Have you thought about it? Like how, how, how many hours of homework do you do? Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I will not make afraid of anyone <laughs> that like too much homework or something, but I will just tell that like you have to study regularly. So if you study regularly here, then you can survive anything and you can complete all of your courses on time. So I will not tell that intensive pressure for the courses or homework, but I will tell that, okay, you have to study regularly. <laughs> That's from my side. <laughs> okay. Good advice. Uh, what about you, Zainab? Mm, uh, for the first semester, uh, because um, I was new to this course, uh, uh, I think I studied seven days a week. For me, it was like the seven days a week, every day at the library. But uh, this semester, I can manage somehow. Mm -hmm. And I think six days a week from 10 to 6, 7 is fine. If you, if, if you start from the... F uh, early semester, yeah, from the first of the mm -hmm. semester. Yeah, you know, it's already sounds yeah, it's quite intensive. <laughs> yes, it's <laughs> intensive. <laughs> what about you, Hazar? Is it similar? Um, for, for my personal experience, I would say it's kind of the same, but I would uh, just to not scare like the students. I would um, give like firsthand, like you could. Uh, it's ho about how you manage your course load. It's like mm -hmm. for this year, we have a sufficient amount of ECTS or like credits to be taken for the entire year. Mm -hmm. And it's just a matter of how you balance those between the two semesters. So for example, with me, I took like um, 36 credits for the uh, last semester. And I would say that... Um, yeah, like what Faisal had said, like you have to study regularly, but it's good in a sense like it when you go to the spring semester, your course load gets lighter and you could do some other stuff aside from studying. And also with the studying regularly, it really helps to refresh your mind because, for example, if you attend these lectures and you just set them aside and you forget like, oh, what, what did I... What was our last lecture about? I forgot already. So doing these homeworks, these um, assignments really help you to like continuously oh, rem remind yourself of the lectures. I think this is um, advice for, that applies for any <laughs> program yes. as well, not just for these programs. Um, but when it comes to applying for these uh, programs, well, you applied and you're here today thanks to your good application. Um, how did the process go? Was was it, um, let's say, any? Was there anything special in the application process? Mm. If you can remember uh, <laughs> how how it went. Gosh, it feels like a long time <laughs> ago already. <laughs> yeah, okay. But yeah, I would say that um, definitely a challenge um, coming here is first off the pandemic, like lots mm. of restrictions, lots of like, uh, before you uh, leave your country, you would have to comply to certain guidelines. Like for example, with me, I had to um, get vaccinated first. 
just so that I can go to the next country for my application for the visa. And that's also another thing with um, coming to Estonia. Like, not all countries have... Uh, Ac yeah, access to the embassies where you could apply visas. So, for example, with me, I had to go to Turkey first, just so that I could apply for a long-term vi long-term visa. And it's a separate process just to apply for another visa, just to come to Turkey. So it's like applying for visa to go to a country where you have to apply for another visa. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a really long process. But if, for example, you live already in that those places, you would you would consider yourself lucky and um what else uh, I, I don't th i don't think there's anything aside yeah aside from the pandemic the pandemic's really big challenge uh, i will add like one thing that um, when we just face those problems the pandemic and those things we cannot come to the country like in mm -hmm. time and our semester was started uh we get like really good support from our academic Mm -hmm. process because like they always help us like okay you can do this one maybe this can help you to go there and you can do even like i remember that uh, we have one course and our program director and he always asked who got this visa to go to the other countries and what is the update of your visa so they were always concerned about this and that was really mm -hmm. special for us because as a students as as a teacher they are always caring about us so i like that one and even like when we applied for this program whatever questions we have we just mm -hmm. mail them and we get the reply within like short one or two days so we don't need to wait for a long time that okay i applied and i am not getting any reply from them mm -hmm. so they always make us like okay we are always with you so that was the special things if i say about the applications our time and if i want to add something sure. want, uh, about the supporting uh, the, um, uh, because uh, every courses are uh, presented also online and also uh, they are all recorded uh, so don't worry if you cannot uh, uh, get your visa at the first moment so uh, you can attend classes online in your home country or later you can watch the sessions so don't worry about that yeah. okay, good thank you for all this helpful information uh now I think maybe a lot of people are curious, and I'm also curious about it. Uh, have you tried learning Estonian? <laughs> <laughs> what is your experience with learning Estonian, uh, Hazar? <laughs> oh my! It's I would say like it's an entirely different language, like True. compared to other European countries, like somewhere in the south where you kind of had this resemblance with some words with English. But here, like, it, it's a Finno-Ugric language. It's, they have a different, uh, uh, like, alphabet. Grammar. <laughs> and grammar, yes. I think, yeah. yeah. So I only know basic words just for everyday, li uh, everyday living. Like, um, you sh uh, incoming students should also know this. Like, uh, when you say hello, you say tere. <laughs> and you have to, like, be smiling all about <laughs> when you do that. And aita. Yeah. Which means thank you. Yeah. yeah. What about you, Zainab? Uh, actually, I took a course, uh, but um, and also it was I think really really complete because uh, after uh, passing that course, I can communicate with Estonian in stores and uh, not uh, professional, but uh, a little bit. I can hold the conversation a little bit. Yeah, I think. Yeah. That's great to hear. Uh, <laughs> what about you, Faith? For me, like yeah, I actually took that one course like uh, it was maybe a one the beginner level and it helped me with because like it was really difficult because like if we learn any new language it's actually difficult but mm -hmm. uh, it helps me like this i can communicate with some people whenever like those necessary things suppose for the for an example i don't know which is the road and where is this so i can mm -hmm. ask them like where is it and mm -hmm. at least i can pronounce the roads rightly mm -hmm. so that people can understand okay this is the directions you can go like this way mm -hmm. so i think like those new students who will come maybe they will also take this one because it will help them to communicate with other people at least like hello and like introduce themselves so i will say that okay yeah and that's why actually that is the reason that i took that course for learning right so i think yeah everyone should take a <laughs> estonian course if they manage to get to estonia um, now i heard that all three of you are living in a dorm mm -hmm. uh, yes. so what can you tell us about the life in the dorms? How, how is it like for you? And which dorms are, do you live 
and <laughs> I think we all live at the same, a same, same one. Yeah. Yeah, the same dormitory. <laughs> so uh it's Ratose twenty two. So it also goes with the name of the the uh down yeah, student the student hostel, I th- I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so you can see like it's very international <laughs> like different um groups of students. Like you could do a lot of stuff. This uh, it's very spacious and you would get access to different uh, amenities. Like there's also like if you want to do ping pong, you could do ping pong. Uh, there are tables there for table tennis. If you want to have some coffee, like vending, there's vending machines, um, laundromats, and also like there's an access if you want to print some documents. And also the uh, administration of the dorm, I think, was, is also there. So if you need something, you need help with something, they're always there to accommodate. And with uh, living there, it's... I don't know uh, with uh, mm-hmm. others, but for me, it's a good place to like really take a relax. And because at least for my experience with my flatmates, like I had really good flatmates there. Uh, I, w- I can interact with them and we would have uh, conversations on the common areas and just chit chat and laugh about some stuff. Yeah, It's really good. Cool. Sounds awesome. What about Zainab, what was your experience? Uh, uh, I like the, the diversity in the dormitory because uh, I live in a, a flat which which we are uh, five uh, students together, but um, from four different countries. So I like that that they uh, separate us like, like this, that we can communicate with international students. And also another thing about the facility that also Hazard said, um, uh, ha- having that space that like ha- playing ping pong, it, it really helps us finding new friends. Uh, because sometimes I was playing with my friends and and some people came, us, came to us and asked uh, to play, to join us. So yeah, we can make friends more. And, uh, um, about the dormitory, they really um, care about us. Whenever we have problem, we just need to write an email, and they uh, do it immediately. Okay, I saw. Yeah, uh, my experience also similar with them, mm-hmm. and I will just add one more thing that our dormitory is actually in the center of the city center, so it's so near. And whenever and wherever you want to go, you can just come from the dorm and take the bus and you can go anywhere so beside that also like uh, i also like this one that in our dorm actually we live with like different international students so like we are providing and we are sharing our cultures our foods with uh, all of them so you can learn so many things about like new countries and that's the most important thing for me that okay i'm learning new cultures from them so yeah Okay, well, thank you. And, uh, well, it seems our discussion uh, is uh, running out of time. And I would like to thank again Hazar, Zainab, and Faisal for this uh, really productive and fun discussion about their programs and their experience in Tartu. Uh, please stay tuned for uh, of the upcoming discussions, and we will see you later. Thank you.
Dear participants of the Open Doors uh, uh, Week at the University of Tartu, we are continuing with our next info session, which is dedicated to natural sciences, second part. And today there are going to be represented three programs, which are bioengineering, material science and technology, and geoinformatics for urbanized society. And today with me, I have Ilona Faustova, who is going to talk about bioengineering master's program. I have uh, Hele Simon, who is going to introduce material science and technology. And then I have Madli Johanna Maida, Maidla, sorry, who is going to talk about geoinformatics for urbanized society. I would like to remind you that we have an excellent chance to, uh, you have an excellent chance to leave your questions and we are going to answer them during the Q&A sessions when all of the presentations are done. So the schedule will be the same as previous webinars. At first we are going to introduce the three programs uh, and then we will open Q&A questions. But anyways, you can leave your questions at any point of the webinar using the workshop link where you can find next to this info session uh, the bottom Q&A where you can write your questions or rate the questions if the same questions were already asked. Okay, I guess uh, that would be it from my side and I will give a word to our first uh, speaker, Ilona Faustova, who is going to introduce uh, uh, our master's program in bioengineering. Uh, thank you, Hanna, and uh, hello to everybody. Uh, I will talk a bit about bioengineering program, and uh, but I will start with uh, talking about Tartu University and Tartu in general. So Tartu is uh, a student's town. Uh, it's uh, situated 200 kilometers from our capital, from Tallinn, and as we name Tartu, Tartu is city of good thoughts, it's a youth city, and the each uh, fifth person living in Tartu is a student or somehow connected to the uh, university, working on studying in, in, in the university. Uh, so, uh, in total, in Tartu is uh, around 100,000 citizens, and as I already mentioned, every fifth is connected to uh, university. And uh, Tartu University uh, is pretty uh, important for our country and uh, for Baltic states, and uh, we are really proud that it belongs to top 1.2% of the world's uh, best universities. So. Uh, it's really a uh, good university with a qu quality uh, education. And if you are getting a uh, high education or master's degree in uh, Tartu University, it qualifies in all over the world and you can continue your studies, uh, for example, on PhD or uh, in any country, uh, because uh, this certificate you, you will get, it qualifies all over the world. And uh, here is some other rankings uh, we are also proud of, and uh, uh, and um, not only uh, our uh, education is high in Tartu, but also science. And uh, if we are talking about the uh, structure of universities, here there is four faculties. It's arts and humanities, social sciences, science and technology, and medicine. So we are representative of science and technology faculty here. And um, as I told, the science is also on pretty high level in Tartu University, and uh, 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 we have uh, also uh, very uh, uh, high articles or scientific research is going on in university, and you can also see that we are top one percent, for example, of the most cited scientists in the world. So. Uh, you don't, don't, we, you don't have to have doubts that here you will get the possibility also to do a science on the high level. So if you want to know more about uh, our town, you can also go to uh, our uh, website and uh, do a virtual tour to see how uh, buildings are situated. And uh, from this map, you already see that uh, buildings of uh, universities all over the town and uh, town is dealing a lot with the university and education and science. 
So now we will talk more about uh, program, but first uh, we will show you a little uh, video about bioengineering master's program. What if I tell you that it is possible to redesign your gut bacteria to treat an ongoing condition? What if I tell you that we can cut down our dependency on fossil fuels by creating biofuels from genetically engineered microorganisms? What if I tell you that you can design life? Bioengineering Master's Program at the University of Tartu gives you a broad understanding and practical skills in the innovative world of biotechnology. Our students gain the knowledge in the applied biotechnology, synthetic biology, engineering and IT. They are trained to do research, to invent and to operate in the labs with cutting edge equipment. Bioengineering Master's program is very flexible as it allows students to design their own study plans to meet their individual goals. Our students have the numerous internship possibilities in the best companies in Estonia. They can also join the most innovative research groups to contribute to the biosustainability of our planet. Treating serious diseases, creating cell factories, synthesizing chemicals, or producing biofuels. These are just some of everyday applications of bioengineering. So don't wait too much. Design your future today and apply now. We're waiting for you. Uh, so it's a little bit about uh, the program in whole, but uh, let's uh, see in details uh, what is the program about. So uh, the bioengineering program is also two years, like the majority of master's degree programs. and. Uh, Mm, you, you are studying uh, the first year mostly uh, courses as well, not doing only master thesis, but uh, the curriculum is designed in such a way that uh, you have the possibility to pass all the courses during the first year and uh, on the second year already focus only on your master thesis. And um, graduates will have an understanding and practical experience covering the main industrial bioprocesses, fermentation, design of biological systems, industrial biotechnology and biomedical technologies. So, but you have pretty much freedom to uh, uh, choose uh, what exactly you want to study and want you uh, to do and what is your master's thesis about. Uh, so the program consists of um, different models. You can see at the moment uh, the main model is uh, has only four compulsory uh, courses. Uh, you you will see you you see these courses on the uh, screen at the moment. So it's synthetic biology, industrial cell factories, it's metabolic engineering and genome design, it's molecular cell and tissue engineering and omics. So these are the only obligatory courses for everyone in the program. And uh, next, you have also to pass um, uh, speciality model courses and from here you already have a freedom to choose uh, uh, courses you need more for your specialization for the for your master's thesis for example you don't need to pass all the courses here is uh, uh, for example courses for 36 uh, credits uh, and you have to find uh, the most interesting for you for 24 credits so there is some kind of uh, flexibility already inside uh, uh, this model, uh, but uh, we also uh, say that if uh, uh, you will find a course which is uh, connected to your speciality, to your master thesis, what you are doing, and want to also include the speciality model, so it's also possible. Uh, and um, besides uh, speciality model, you have also to pass a professional practice model. It consists mostly all of the practices or practical courses. Uh, here you can see uh, two courses which uh, are scheduled and will be given during the, your studies. 
course is not connected to master's thesis, but the rest is uh, a lot connected to the master thesis. For example, the practical training in bioengineering, which provides nine uh, credits, it's a practical part of your master thesis, what you're doing in research lab, and uh, the seminars in bioengineering, which is six credits, it's also uh, uh, your master's thesis. You are doing some uh, uh, practical stuff in, in the labs, and uh, on seminars you are giving overview and then you have you can get the practical training in bioengineering and seminars in bioengineering points and also from this uh, model you have to gain 24 credits so it also gives you uh, freedom and possibility to take uh, courses or not to take and uh, also there is a possibility of internship in bio enterprise or research uh, lab semester abroad uh, if uh, you have something in your mind so you can for example do the mobility go for semester abroad and substitute uh, the elective model for example uh, if you are not going uh, abroad then uh, you have to do also elective mod elective uh, courses and it's uh, 12, 12 uh, credits for elective course and uh, for sure, six credits of optional courses, it can be any courses of the university. So, And at the, at the end, you are doing defense of your master thesis. You, there is no uh, exam at the end, but uh, master thesis defense. So as I told you that uh, there is a lot of uh, actually the international uh, exchange possibilities also Erasmus program or Dora Plus uh, program and also uh, studying on bioengineering program you can use these opportunities and to go and study abroad. And uh, some important information about uh, how to apply to the program. So if you are interested in bioengineering, uh, you have to apply before uh, March 15th. So it's pretty soon already. And uh, uh, when you are entering our program, our requirements that you have a bachelor level in some science or te technology field or, uh, or field of medicine and also uh, we need a um, motivation letter. Uh, to apply to our program, you have to have proof that you have the B2 level of English. And uh, how we count our points, uh, entering points, it's 50% uh, uh, gives your GPA of the previous education and 50% is motivation letter. When you're writing motivation letter, definitely check the questions what we need to answer uh, writing the motivation letter and uh, add any of your ideas or advantages uh, as a candidate for specifically bioengineering program. So uh, for the program there is uh, also uh, scholarships Restitution waiver scholarships for the best candidates. You don't need to apply separately. Uh, there is some uh, scholarship for EU students, but also some uh, scholarships uh, for non-EU students. Uh, but the amount is limited, and you don't need to apply for this separately. Uh, while applying to the program, the best candidates will be chosen to get the tuition waiver scholarships and. Uh, 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 both so and also there is a Dora uh, scholarship what you can uh, apply and Ministry of Foreign Affairs scholarships. So the important dates for you it's uh, as 15th of March so you have to do the application before 15th of March. The later applications uh, unfortunately will be not uh, uh, taken into account and. Uh, uh, just a bit about living in Estonia, that uh, uh, as the accommodation in Estonia is possible in dormitories, for example, and uh, the rent is um, around 150 euro per month. I am not sure if it's just now went a little bit higher, but in average I think it's uh, still 150 euro per month. And uh, the costs of living, it depends uh, on the people, on the how much everyone needs a, a different amount of money li to live in Estonia, but in average it's around 450 euros per month. But you always can also contact our uh, ambassadors and uh, our marketing specialists if you have some additional questions so about living in Estonia or how to uh, apply to program or any, any questions what you have.
And like that, uh, you can see the, uh, it's uh, one of the dormitories where the majority of our program students live. So it's pretty uh, good uh, conditions for living, actually, there. And just a little bit about life uh, in Tartu as well. We have not uh, only studies, we are not only studying, but we have different entertainments. And uh, uh, for example, we have the students' days while you can see different competitions going on, different uh, interesting events. Also, we have different uh, clubs, uh, different uh, uh, units of students. So uh, it will be not uh, definitely boring here and uh, you will not only study but you will have also the social part of life. So it's just some of the pictures. So if you liked the program and if you have the interest to towards the bioengineering program you can but you still have questions even after our webinar will be over you can ask questions today during the webinar but also you can write uh, straight to me or to our ambassadors and we will wait for you in estonia Thank you very much, Ilona, for your presentation and also for providing the overview not only about your program and curriculum, but also about the University of Tartu and life in Estonia in general. Uh, I would also remind you that after this session, we will also have a student discussion session where we also will have representatives from all of the programs, uh, basically students who are currently enrolled to these programs, and they're also going to discuss uh, their experience from their perspective. And also, if you would like to see, for example, how the dormitory looks inside or how the Institute of uh, Science looks inside of or any other of scientific buildings, then we are uh, welcoming you to join us on Wednesday when we are going to have our online tours. And now I'm going to uh, encourage you as well to leave your questions. Uh, so please leave your questions, write them down to works up, and then during the Q&A session, we are going to answer them. And I will give a floor to Halle Simon, who is going to talk about the material science and technology. Halle, please, the floor is yours. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This will be the introduction to material science and technology master's program. This program is uh, for... Uh, for pre preparing specialists uh, for manufacturing enterprises and uh, research institutions, specialists who understand uh, relations between material science and science and technologies, and on the other hand, the businesses and economy. Our graduates are able to continue a doctoral level and the degree which is awarded after graduation and defending your master's thesis, it is Master of Science in Material Science and Technology. Our program is concentrated on science, on material science, the properties of materials and technologies of materials, and the aim is to develop the materials. And people who apply the scientific knowledge of material science, they must know relations between <laughs> the science and, and uh, businesses and economy and therefore basics of entrepreneurship is also included in our program. As Ilona already told, there are four faculties in the University of Tartu and all our programs uh, in this webinar, they are from the Faculty of Science and Technology. In our faculty, there are nine institutes. These are research institutes. And students uh, who study material science and technology 
and also research in material science. It, it's done mainly in three institutes. Uh, these are Institute of Physics, Institute of Chemistry and Institute of Technology. On the picture, uh, there is a first uh, day of a study uh, be, uh, in front of Physicum, the main building of the Institute of Physics. We hope very much that Corona restrictions <laughs> are over and uh, next autumn the students can gather in front of the building and get together again. Uh, these institutes are all research institutes and our students are involved in the research work, not only in, in their studies. In our program, every student uh, joins one uh, research lab of some institute already <laughs> during the first uh, semester when he has come here to study. Here are some examples of uh, research topics where material uh, science students have been in involved. First, energetics, materials for energetics, which are uh, studied in the Institute of Chemistry and Institute of of technology mainly, these are supercapacitors, hydrogen storage, and so on. Nanomaterials. Nanomaterials uh, seem to be a part of, of science in very many science areas nowadays. Then biocompatible materials and biomaterials at all. For example, dental implants, coatings for dental implants, it was a topic of, of uh, several material science uh, students uh, in their master's thesis. Then optical materials uh, for luminophores, sensors, it's studied mainly in the Institute of Physics. teaching of material science at the University of Tartu. Material science has been taught uh, here in Estonian for a long time, but in English the master's program uh, is not very, uh, very old. Our first graduates defended their master's thesis a year ago less than a year ago, last spring. So the curriculum consists of six modules. There are two compulsory modules, material science module and entrepreneurship module. Then there are elective courses and optional courses and practice and master thesis. The uh, first obligatory uh, module is material science module, where uh, there are main principles and terms of material science, which are included in the uh, nine points uh, course, theoretical principle of material science. Then students study testing and investigation methods of materials, development of materials courses. There are two courses. First one is on the first semester and the second part is on the last semester of the studies. And master seminar is also in this material science module. The second obligatory module is entrepreneurship module, where 
basics of entrepreneurship uh, are included in a six-point lecture course. And there are also seminars uh, which uh, take place in three uh, different semesters. Elective courses are for students to study courses about material science or entrepreneurship. And foreign students can learn Estonian language uh, in the amount of six points also as elective course. Optional courses, as for all the curricula uh, in Tartu, optional courses uh, may be chosen from any courses, from any faculties of the university. Practice, it's internship. Third semester, that means uh, the autumn semester of the second year, is intended for the internship. Uh, really, students may do the internship in summer if they, uh, if they want to and if they uh, find a company way to do it. And uh, the internship is finished and completed with the seminar and a report. An option for the third semester is uh, going to some foreign university as an exchange student. Uh, so, the last part of the curriculum is master thesis. Students are allowed to defend their master's thesis if they are completed all the other courses and modules. However, they begin the uh, work of the master's thesis already on the first semester where, uh, when they search the lab where to do it, where to do uh, the experimental part of the thesis and to find the supervisor. Why to study material science? Development of products includes development of materials and advancement uh, of materials, new and better materials. And really, Advancements in material science are the basis for the advancements in all the society as well. So why to study in Tartu? I think our students are it's a good company. And also my colleagues that's also a good company. There are many events arranged for students in Tartu, and material science students can take part of all uh, of them. And there are several student organizations, and uh, there material science students also can join the student organizations. So, you are welcome. Thank you very much, Hella, for your presentation and for introducing this wonderful program, Material Science and Technology. I thank you for providing also information about the organizations and also about the curriculum. Uh, so I would remind our participants to leave your questions. So if you are interested to apply to material science and technology, this is the time to ask your questions right now from the program manager. And now we are going to move to another presentation, which is going to be dedicated to geoinformatics for urbanized society. 
And I'm going to give a floor to Madli Johanna Maidla. Thank you. Uh, hello to everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to be here and to introduce uh, this program, Chain Informatics for Urban Society, uh, to you today. Uh, yeah, so I'm the program director of this program and all the other programs in our Department of Geography. Um, so to give a little bit background, uh, we all know that we are living in a quite um, fast changing and uh, difficult uh, world right now. Uh, the health crisis have been here for the last two years. Uh, the climate change is um, slow but ongoing process and uh, we also have the different um, other global uh, challenges like uh, urban poetry or segregation and also the land use change uh, that affects um, migration and all different kind of um, um, <coughs> topics. And uh, our uh, program, the Chain Informatics for Urban Society, is developed uh, keeping in mind those uh, challenges. And uh, our aim is to um, educate people, uh, give their, uh, them uh, the knowledge about the problems and um, give the tools how to um, uh, take the data and uh, give some um, solutions for the, this kind of uh, problems and also how to how these um, solutions uh, will will uh, find their way to the policy and um, planners uh, so our uh, program uh, basically has uh, two uh, pillars uh, first as mentioned um, uh, we give uh, the knowledge of spatial processes both societal and uh, environmental um, processes that are going on, for example, segregation or um, climate crisis. And on the other hand, um, we teach you the skills of data processing, uh, both um, geographic uh, information systems uh, and other uh, methods and programming languages from uh, IT. Uh, so you can uh, implement uh, them on the previously claimed, gained uh, knowledge of um, different uh, spatial problems. Um, as already mentioned before by the other speakers, um, we also have um, research-based studies. So we have different uh, labs and uh, research teams uh, in our um, department that uh, have uh, developed those uh, courses uh, that you are going to be studying. Uh, for example, the Mobility Lab uh, focuses on mobility studies, uh, the Centre for um, Migration and Urban Studies um, uh, researches urban change, migration, segregation, uh, gentrification, and then we also have the environmental uh, labs, uh, from landscape ecology and environmental technology. And all those labs are using uh, geoinformatical systems uh, to do their research. And we also have a uh, geoinformatics uh, research uh, team uh, who will um, also teach you the different methods and the skills how to combine all those uh, different uh, knowledge from the uh, societal and environmental part uh, together. Um, and um, uh, so, um, as, uh, as I said before, we focus uh, very much on data, how to uh, collect data and how to analyze and um, make decisions based on the data. As uh, right now we have this uh, quite um, this kind of world that we produce very much data and we collect very much data, uh, the big data. Uh, so it's very useful to know how to process it and how to gain the best of it, the most of it. And, and also how to um, uh, process, analyze and also visualize the data because uh, 
um, if the scientists, scientists get um, uh, the raw data, um, it doesn't, it, it's not useful for the decision makers. But when we analyze it and when we make it visual, uh, as geographers use a lot of uh, maps, for example, and the graphs, um, then it's, it's also useful for the decision makers and it uh, really has an emphasis on their real life. Um, so the teaching and learning is um, lab-based and we have a lot of uh, courses where you will have um, hands-on uh, learning. So you have real problems to solve and real data to do it. Uh, we also have different courses uh, where we teach uh, different uh, geoinformatic systems and different um, databases, different um, programming uh, languages. Uh, our curriculum structure is quite similar to previous ones. Uh, we have uh, the mandatory courses and uh, elective and optional courses. Uh, the first module um, is um, consisted of two big courses, the Spatial Data Studio and Planning Project, that are the core sub subjects. And um, where you get the, the basic knowledges. And then we have the geography mandatory module, uh, where you can um, get the knowledge of uh, different uh, processes I mentioned before, and also the um, skills um, to use um, different um, sp spatial analysis tools. Um, and the first and the second semester, so the first uh, year of your studies is uh, mainly about mandatory courses, but then the second year is uh, more up to you. Uh, the third semester uh, is uh, the mobility window, when you, where you can um, uh, go to study abroad, or also if you want to study in Tartu, we have uh, different courses in here. And the uh, fourth semester is uh, mainly for the master thesis. During the summer, uh, you will have the um, compulsory internship and then there are the optional courses you can uh, choose freely from all over the university. Uh, some examples, uh, examples from the courses. The Spatial Data Studio is basically the first course when you are going, coming here. Uh, in the first there are some leveling exercises, but then um, it, uh, it has uh, or it, it teaches you the whole process uh, of the data. So from the collecting the data, cleaning the data, analyzing, processing and visualizing, visualizing the data. Uh, and on the second semester, after you, after you have um, gained all this visualization and analysis uh, skills, you will have a real planning project uh, for example, in a couple of years ago, the students analyzed where to put uh, the new um, bike sharing stations for the Tartu bike share we have in here. Um, and also some um, visualization uh, exercises the students have done with uh, Python and R, for example. Um, there are um, a lot of uh, professors and uh, top-level lecturers you will meet uh, during the studies. All our um, professors uh, of our department is going to study, uh, teach you. Uh, we also have uh, quite a lot of uh, visiting professors from, uh, for example, Belgium, uh, Germany or uh, USA that give uh, some elective courses in our um, program. Uh, a little bit more about the uh, academic mobility and the semester abroad. Uh, so it's, it takes place usually during the third semester. Most of the students so far have used the Erasmus uh, Plus uh, partnership. Uh, and uh, those are, this is the list of the universities our uh, students have gone to to study. Uh, but we also have um, approximately 30 different universities that we have agreements with. So the option is uh, quite big. And we really uh, encourage students to do it. And also 
this corona crisis and traveling restrictions haven't um, affected the students uh, that much. We, we still have students who go to abroad and they really enjoy it. Um, so uh, the internship is um, the compulsory part of the program. It takes place during the summer between the first and second study year. Uh, there is also opportunity to use the Erasmus Plus um, tra traineeship uh, program to uh, do their um, in internship in other uh, European uh, countries. So if you are, for example, uh, from Europe, you can do it in your home country. But we also have uh, uh, quite many organizations uh, in Estonia that we have um, good relations with and uh, they are some of them are located here in Tartu, some of, here, some of them in the capital of Tallinn. So there is a um, big uh, variety and selection. Uh, just some examples of the master thesis that our students have um, written. Uh, the fact that you are going to be studying in Estonia doesn't matter that you have to do your master thesis about Estonia or Tartu. We have had the master thesis about Ghana, Italy, Malaysia, and um, basically sky is the limit. If you have the data and it's the uh, spatial, um, spatial problem that you want to solve, this uh, probably is geography. But mainly um, in this um, yellow box there are the main um, themes or topics that uh, we are uh, researching uh, in our department and um, all, uh, most of the master thesis are done on those topics. A little bit uh, our alumni and uh, what is waiting for, for you after you graduate. Uh, the last graduates on this uh, top row, Ivan and Olga, just uh, graduated uh, a year ago. And they both are now working in Estonia. Uh, Ivan is working in Positium, where he actually also uh, did uh, his internship. Uh, and uh, Olga is in Kapaseta, that is a, a remote sensing uh, company. And we also have um, some uh, students who have um, um, doing their PhD, some in our university, in our department, but some also in other European universities. Um, and just a little bit uh, more about uh, community and student life. Um, uh, this is uh, in the, on the picture is our main uh, building. It's in a uh, city centre, in, in his historical building, and it's, um, I would say, it's a really good place because Tartu is quite small and you can walk to everywhere. Uh, I think the main uh, dormitories are 20 minutes walk from our building, and the city centre is like 10, 15 minutes. Uh, we also have different events and activities for the students and for the whole department. As the program is quite young, uh, five years, uh, we don't have really much traditional activities, but every year we start with the academic year kickoff. And also um, this year we had the chance to meet uh, in snowy Estonia for the ski seminar. And also uh, some of our students uh, got uh, their first experience, uh, for example, with uh, cross-country skiing. Uh, and the studies um, are done both in uh, indoor labs and outdoor labs. So we have a lot of uh, computer labs in our computer class, but there are some also some excursions in cities and in the field. Uh, also, as mentioned already before, but there are different opportunities what to do, um, uh, except for studies, there are many organization uh, you can uh, be part of. And yeah, I would also uh, say that Tartu is the cozy student town and it's really nice to be a student in this uh, city. And if you want uh, more information, uh, 
just visit our website. There is uh, a lot of more information and also our uh, Facebook page. And you can also write um, to us there the messages and we will answer them. So I hope you all um, got the information and are applying to our university. Thank you very much, Madli Johanna, for your presentation and for introducing not only the program, but also internships, career opportunities and also the social scene of Tartu itself. Thank you very much for it. And right now, I think we will going to continue with our Q&A session. We have received quite some questions. Uh, so let's start with the first one. Uh, it is addressed to the uh, to bioengineering program. Uh, any graduate student from medicine requires some extra knowledge regarding engineering to apply to this master program. Uh, no, you don't need uh, uh, some engineering uh, studies if you have medicine uh, education, but we always mention that uh, uh, as a lot of uh, students come in like with very broad uh, backgrounds. So everyone has a possibility uh, when they arrive already to uh, our program to chart to, to take elective uh, courses, which will help to fill the gaps you are having in one or other discipline. So for example, we need uh, the knowledge of biology definitely, but if you have not had enough, then you have the possibility to take biology and you have to take and to study the biology as well. The same with programming or engineering stuff. So. Um, but to op but you can apply with uh, medical uh, education, yeah. medical Thank degree. Much. Thank you very much. Uh, the next program, uh, the next program, the next question is going to be addressed to Helle. Uh, so this is about career opportunities after the graduation material science and technology. So where can I work after graduation? And maybe you have some uh, already alumni that are working somewhere, so you can also provide some examples. Okay. It's uh, decided that uh, our graduates will work in some manufacturing companies which deal with materials, uh, which, which, which produce materials or in, in some laboratories which analyze uh, some materials or in the research institutes or uh, they continue their studies at master's level about the graduates, uh, uh, examples of the companies from, uh, uh, from Estonia, uh, there are not very much companies. However, for example, Estico Plaster is, is one of them. Then in Sillame, uh, there is a company, <coughs> there are uh, several companies uh, <coughs> which produce metals and our our students have made their internship for example in in Pärnu or in uh, in Elva where is an electronic uh, company uh, however many of our graduates uh, now we have we have uh, 10 graduates uh, uh, today because uh, these were the first graduates at all from our program. And uh, many of them are continuing uh, on the doctoral level. Uh, at least uh, three of them are in the University of Tartu. One is in, uh, is on, in doctoral studies in India. Okay. Yeah, thank you for such a detailed information about your graduates. Thank you. Uh, the next question is going to be for Geoinformatics and Urbanized Society. So the question is more related to admission process. So are there any prerequisite courses in order to apply to the program? Uh, there is... Um so uh, there should, you should have been studied uh, in your previous level. Uh, 30 credits worth of um, different courses that are connected to either a geography or um, also uh, program, uh, programming, uh, social sciences um, that are more like 
related to geography because the geography also have quite a um, big part of social sciences. Uh, so um, I would say, uh, yeah, so there are, so you, sh you should have 30, 30 credits of um, some courses that are connected to geography or um, programming. And um, it is possible if you um, to study in our program also if you don't have um, previous background in, uh, in geography exactly and you don't have uh, what is uh, QGIS or ArcGIS for, um, for example because we have also the leveling courses in the first year, the first semester of the studies. Um, but of course it's easier if you already have some background there also. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for your answer. We received quite many questions about scholarships. So such as, for example, how many students in the bioengineering program usually get monthly scholarship? Then we received how many tuition waivers do you have from non-European Union countries? So maybe we are going to just to make a round uh, and answer questions about the scholarships, other, uh, other tuition waivers at your programs uh, and any other opportunities for our applicants. Maybe, uh, Ilona, let's start with you. Uh, about uh, tuition, uh, tuition uh, waiver, uh, in our program we have um, around, it's not the exact number, but uh, around uh, five uh, uh, scholarship. And um, these are already together like non-European ones and uh, European for you ones. And uh, the monthly stipend, uh, which is uh, pro probably DORA and uh, MFS, so it depends on each year. It's uh, usually one, two uh, stipends, but uh, the exact number will be announced a bit later. Mm -hmm. Hello. Uh, in material science and technology program, there are tuition weaver uh, scholarships. There are seven scholarships for European uh, students and uh, really uh, one uh, scholarship for non-European uh, student. However, there, uh, there is also a foreign affairs ministry uh, scholarship and now this year it was decided in the Institute of Physics that uh, one uh, tuition weaver scholarship will be uh, from the side of, of the Institute of Physics. Mm -hmm. uh, what else to say? Most of our students have joined uh, some research lab at the beginning of, of their studies and almost all of them uh, get uh, some scholarships uh, which is organized by uh, by their supervisors from res uh, from this research lab uh, of course they do research work there mm -hmm. thank you very much uh, then let's continue with Madli Johanna how is about your program yeah, in uh, geoinformatics for urban society I would say it's quite uh, the same as Ilona said about uh, bioengineering so for the next year we have uh, four uh, tuition waivers for um, non-European countries and one for European country, countries. And also there is the chance for DORA and the uh, Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is addressed to Ilona. Is it possible to get a job at the Research Institute for Biotech Company while studying bioengineering? Um, it it is possible to get a job uh, in some research uh, lab, as already Hele also told that uh, there are some uh, research labs which hire and uh, uh, pay stipend to the student, uh, and uh, also there is a possibility to uh, start working in bio enterprises. But I think in bio enterprises it's a bit more complicated, as uh, it will interrupt your studies because uh, you still, as bioengineering program is really a lot connected to practical experience, to practical studies, then uh, we have uh, uh, a lot of courses, practical courses you have to visit. Uh, attendance is mandatory and you also have to deal with your master's thesis. Uh, so I think that it's easier if you find a job in research group where you are doing your master's thesis. So it will be, uh, otherwise it will be too uh, time consuming. Thank you very much. Also, we received different questions about motivation letter, but I just combined, combined it and asked you to 
uh, tell maybe some uh, tips how to write a good motivation letter for your programs and uh, what is requ required or requested at your department, what are you looking at. Of course, we have the requirements on the website, but it's uh, important also to point out uh, some certain things. Maybe let's start uh, with you, uh, with Gen Informatics. Yeah. Yeah, so of course the most detailed um, like description what you should write is on the web page. Um, I would say that um, um, in the motivation letter we want to see your motivation, like what is your, exactly, what is your real uh, experience before? Like if you have uh, studied geography or you have already the background of geoinformatics, it's uh, good if we get to know that. Um, and if you don't have, then uh, what's your motivation to learn it? And uh, if you come from another field, uh, for example, uh, um, social sciences or any other natural sciences, that uh, what do you think, how you can uh, combine your previous knowledge of this uh, uh, program and our um, geoinformatics that you will uh, learn in here? Um, and also, uh, usually there's a question that, uh, what do you think, um, what, what can be your um, master thesis about? Uh, for us, um, uh, it doesn't have to be exactly the master thesis you are uh, going to write. And uh, we don't check it afterwards that you are writing the same thing. But um, this already shows us um, how you how you think in which field you sh you want to go, and um, um, yeah, basically. <laughs> okay, now I Thank don't you. know that's knowledge. Thank you very much, Hella. What uh, what do you expect from uh, potential applicants uh, from their motivation letters? Our expectations are almost the same. Uh, in in your motivation letter, please write about yourself, your previous studies and your work experience and how it is connected with material science and uh, try to explain why <coughs> and how your, uh, your previous experience uh, fits to material science and how and, and why uh, you, uh, you need and want to study material science. But motivation letter is only one thing, uh, only one, uh, one part uh, when you apply. There is also the average uh, grade of the bachelor studies and also an interview. Oh. Thank you very much. Ilona, what about your uh, program? Our, in, for our program, it's pretty much the same like for my colleagues' programs. Uh, we really want to see your motivation, why you chose our program, what background you have, and uh, what are your plans uh, for future. Have you thought through or not uh, uh, how you will apply a future degree in life, in science, what, uh, what are your future plans as well. Uh, because actually when you are reading the motivation letter, you, you see if the person just applying for different programs like in different institutes and it's uh, just on uh, one of the programs he is applying or she is applying or a person uh, really uh, motivated to study in our case bioengineering thought through uh, what uh, or how he will need the bioengineering knowledge in uh, future or what he will do in his life in future and uh, we are always uh, appreciate if for example you are switching background it was a bit similar what my colleagues were telling that also to explain why you are uh, switching the background uh, or how you will apply the previous knowledge in the uh, in our program in your future program Thank you very much, Ilona. Also, Hella touched two topics that we have questions about. First of all, the GPA. So what is the average GPA should I have in order to apply? And the second one, is there an entrance interview? And if yes, then uh, what kind of questions should I expect? So maybe, Hella, let's start with you because you have already mentioned about that and then we can continue with other programs. The GPA, I think it's 60% uh, 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 from the ma uh, maximum 
maximum grade. And I think uh, it's uh, similar for other programs also. And about uh, the interview, <laughs> the interview, it will... I shall uh, send letters and invite to the... Uh, and we, we shall invite to the interview uh, the candidates, uh, the best candidates, uh, by the motivation letters and, and the average grade. And uh, speak about the, the interview. There, there is a commission who listens to you. The interview is arranged uh, via internet. We have made it in uh, teams uh, during uh, the previous years, and uh, the candidate uh, it lasts uh, ten minutes only, uh, and uh, these ten minutes uh, the uh, the main speech is uh, by the candidate who speaks about himself, and. Uh, also, the topics are similar, or almost the same as in the motivation letter. And uh, then uh, some questions about material science or about mathematics are asked. So we, we expect that uh, you, are, you, you know the, the topics and the materials you have studied before, if you, uh, if you have studied, uh, for example, chemistry, then uh, the question will be from chemistry. If you have studied maybe materials, uh, material science, then uh, there. Uh, it's because our candidates uh, are from different, uh, different areas of science, so they must have the, the degree, uh, bachelor's degree or equivalent education uh, from science and technology. And it's a very wide area. Yeah, thank you very much for so detailed answer. Uh, I will ask the same question from Madli Johanna. If you have an entrance interview to your program and if you have any requirements for the average grades of our applicants. Um, uh, I think until now, um, the previous, I'm uh, quite new program director, so I haven't made any interviews myself uh, yet. Uh, and previously also we have, I think, made really like few interviews, uh, only with those people who we can't see exactly based on the motivation letter. We are not uh, sure that if this person fits in our uh, curriculum or not. So um, I think most of all, with most people, we don't make uh, the interviews. Um, and, um, and, the, and the average uh, grade, uh, I think it's the same, uh, the, the, the same standard for all uh, programs. Um. Thank you very much. Ilona, what about you? Uh, very similar as, uh, about GPA, it's uh, over 50 percent, but uh, in our program, together with motivation letter, you have to get at least 66 percent. Uh, so, but it's uh, the overall uh, regulation for all programs. And uh, about interviews, uh, we are doing sometimes interviews. Interview is not compulsory, uh, but you can get uh, the invitation for interview if you don't mind, and then. Uh, it's uh, very similar yeah, uh, for motiva with motivation letter. Then uh, we are asking your motivation about your motivation to come here, about your background, maybe more in details, and uh, if we have some questions about uh, knowledge is in some specific uh, uh, courses, uh, do you have it or not? So, but it's mostly uh, for understanding. Uh, is the motivation to come to our program right and if we suit to to you so that you will get uh, the required knowledge from our program uh, so but yeah but it's not compulsory one 
Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is also addressed to Ilona. So what are the examples of master theses at the bioengineering program? Maybe if you have uh, something in mind or maybe you can direct people where they can find uh, the list of the master's programs on the website. Actually, yes, uh, I can forward later a link uh, where you can find uh, dif different master's uh, theses. Uh, because yes, I have some in mind, but it's so broad area, uh, you can write, um, uh, studying in bioengineering curriculum, it's, uh, bioengineering is so broad, you can specialize or write uh, the master's thesis uh, even in Institute of Chemistry or Institute of Technology or Institute of Physics, so it's pretty broad and uh, you can do a lot of different uh, uh, scientific projects in it. Yes. Uh, so our next question is about the language requirements, so English language requirements, and they're required to all of the programs that we have on the stage, and I guess the requirement is the same. So basically, what kind of level of IELTS uh, do you require? If maybe... Uh, if someone knows, you can uh, just... Uh, yeah. The question was about IELTS? IELTS. Yes. IELTS. So it's uh, uh, 6.0? Uh, the and no one part can be less than 5.5 so it's important because sometimes you have the overall score 6.0 but so if some part will be uh, less than 5.5 then unfortunately you cannot apply to our programs and it, the, the regulation is the same for all programs mm -hmm. thank you very much and you can also visit our website and we have our english uh, requirements on the website so we do, we accept many tests we accept also cambridge test and toefl test so you can check out which test you would prefer to take as well and the requirement from our side uh, so the next uh, question is to geoinformatics and urbanized society uh, what is the admission criteria for the program um so as it already been, has been here in, uh, in this topic, um, it's also the 50% um, um, 50 of the, uh, is the GPA, GPA mm -hmm. and 50% is the motivation letter. And also if you get, uh, we create them, uh, the motivation letters and the total score or like the minimum score is uh, 66 uh, points and the top level is uh, 100 points. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question that we have about internships, because uh, all the programs require internships according to the uh, presentations that we have just seen. And the question is, uh, how can I choose my internship and if the university is helping somehow with internship? Maybe Ilona, you can start. Um. In, yeah, in our program we have this mobility and you can do internships and um, it's uh, not compulsory in our program but uh, it's uh, the way you can uh, substitute for example elective model and um, uh, usually our students find uh, the internship by themselves uh, with the help maybe with uh, uh, of a research group where they are doing the master's thesis because it's good if uh, you are going uh, to do something connected to your thesis but if you wish you can find completely separate project and separate uh, 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 topic for your internship and uh, also you can go then to the uh, to internship abroad for the semester, but uh, usually we, ad we are advising to connect it with your master thesis, uh, not just uh, not uh, to lose time and graduate in two years. And uh, also in this case, uh, the, your research lab can be helpful with finding the internship. Thank you very much. Hello, would you like to continue? In the material science, the students also must find their internship place themselves and uh, usually they do it and <coughs> the places have been in Estonia but uh, I know one student who has been in uh, Korea also uh, uh, there were relations uh, between the lab where uh, the student <laughs> Uh, worked during uh, the studies and uh, the lab where uh, where she worked uh, recommended her, her there to do uh, her internship there. However, many of our students have made uh, their internship 
the, in the research labs in the University of Tartu, it was mm, one reason of it uh, wo, have been the corona because of restrictions. Uh, it has been uh, hard to find uh, a place in a company. Yeah, that's understandable. Mm -hmm. Thank so, you. So you, you may find your internship place also in the university research lab. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Madli Johanna? Mm -hmm. And uh, as I a little bit already explained it in my presentation, but um, we have a quite good cooperation with different um, companies in Estonia. I would say at least uh, 15 companies, um, mainly from the um, informatics or the IT um, field, but also some other like uh, social sciences or um, natural sciences um, uh, fields. Um, and it's like it's also the same that the student actually has to. Uh, apply there and uh, get the space themselves like we don't have the exact we don't um, uh, say student that you have to go there or there um, but you can freely choose uh, you can also choose yourself uh, other companies that we don't have um, some uh, relations and also uh, there's the opportunity to go abroad uh, I know at least um, I think five uh, students uh, until now have gone to uh, Latvia, Czech Republic, to Spain uh, to do their um, internship there. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another question. Uh, the applicant uh, is asking if it's possible to work and study at the same time. Would you recommend that or not? Maybe, Ilona, you can start. Um, it depends on your work, so we, it's not prohibited to work during your studies, but again it's really nice if your work is connected to your master thesis and uh, to your research. Uh, on master studies you don't have as much courses, compulsory courses, as during bachelor studies and uh, you have uh, more freedom to uh, I mean in time that you can even work in some other companies not in university but I think it's still then complicated to focus on your thesis as well uh, when you are working uh, in companies. Thank you. Hella, do you want to comment as well? There are materials and students who have worked in, in restaurants or in, in uh, teaching of dancing. However, I do not recommend uh, such working, but uh, joining a research lab and uh, the research work, uh, uh, that's what I rec recommend. Thank you very much. And then we can continue, Madli Johanna. Yeah, I would say the same. Uh, of course, it also depends on the workload, if you're working uh, part-time or full-time job. Of course, full-time job and full-time studying, it's really difficult and really hard. And the only the best of the students can actually do it. Um, as the others said, that it's possible to have some part-time job maybe in the institute. In our geog uh, geography department, it's um, we don't have many of this kind of jobs, but we have some students who have. Um, um, if you do the internship in the first summer, uh, the summer the first after the first uh, study year, uh, they have uh, had a chance to do the part-time job in the same company. So it's also again the same. It's the it's the program related, the geography related job that, uh, that I would say it's a good opportunity to use. Thank you very much. Uh, we have two questions to bioengineering program. Uh, first of all, is it common for bioengineering student to transition to PhD or are they mostly into building a career in the industry? Um. Actually, uh, we have uh, both uh, graduates uh, studying in uh, uh, PhD studies and also uh, working in uh, bioenterprises nowadays uh, after graduating from bioengineering. Uh, uh, it's probably a bit more about still science, uh, but uh, it's not uh, it's not compulsory. But yeah, as a 
part of students are going to buy enterprises uh, after getting master's thesis, or master's degree, and uh, part continues in PhD studies. Mm -hmm. so, Thank well. you very much. Uh, we have the follow-up question from the same student in medicine. Does work and experience in medicine count towards the application criteria for bioengineering? Uh, it's, uh, it doesn't count, unfortunately, but uh, you still can mention it in motivation letters, so it uh, will give us a better uh, overview about your skills, about your background, and uh, maybe in motivation letter, depending on your experience, working experience, maybe it will give uh, additional points uh, to motivation letter. Thank you very much. We have another question about the courses. So how do courses look like? Uh, are your classes lecture-based or discussion-based? How much theoretical and practical uh, practice we will gain? Uh, so uh, maybe uh, let's also answer from the perspective of each program. So maybe Madli Johanna, you can start. Mm -hmm. um, I would say there's everything, or like all the, all the aspects you mentioned. Um, I think all the courses have some proportion of lectures, but um, if I think really quickly, quickly, I think we don't have any courses that are only lecture based. So there definitely are some seminars, some practicals, practicums, uh, as we have a lot of um, this programming and uh, GIS uh, courses like Th those are very practical. You really have to try those uh, analyses yourself. Uh, you will have the data, either our um, lecturers will give the data to you or you will have to search the data for yourself. Um, so I would say it's uh, really practical. Of course, there are some uh, theoretical uh, lectures, but most of all, it's practical. Thank you very much. Hella, how is it with your program? In the program of, ma of material science and technology, among the uh, compulsory courses, there are courses of lectures and seminars, as uh, it is uh, the theoretical principles of material science, then development of materials course, uh, it's uh, 12 points. It includes uh, lectures, but more seminars and some practical training also. And then there is uh, master seminars uh, where all students make their presentations. And uh, then uh, uh, the testing and investigation methods of materials are included there. Uh, and uh, this is totally experimental uh, course. And, and students first uh, study the, the principles of the investigation method and then work in the laboratory. And in case of entrepreneurship courses, there is one uh, lecture course, six point lecture course of the basics and uh, then seminars, mostly seminars. Thank you very much, Helen, Ilona. Mm -hmm. um, Bioengineering emphasizes practical teaching, practical studies, um, but we also have everything. We have lectures, we have seminars, uh, journal clubs, uh, presentations, and uh, uh, practical courses in the labs. So, everything. Thank you very much. Uh, so I would like also to uh, tell to our applicants who is asking uh, questions about visa related questions, for example, that we have a visa support team at our university. So if you have any questions regarding uh, organizing your documents, once you're admitted, you can uh, contact our department, our department, which is study abroad center, visa support at, uh, dot, at ut .e, or if you have any very specific admission related questions regarding your documents, then it would be better also to contact admission office and you can just write to admissions at ut.e. And of course, you can find all of these contacts on our website and uh, you can easily contact all of the departments that uh, are responsible for the certain questions. So I think we don't have any questions anymore. So on this note, 
I will. Uh, I want to thank you for participating in our uh, info session uh, dedicated to natural sciences uh, second part. And I would like to ask you to stay with us because we are going to continue with our students who are from these programs that were today represented from geoinformatics and urbanized society, material science and technology, and bioengineering. So they are going to provide also their perspective. How is it to study this program and how is it to live in Estonia? So I highly encourage you to uh, join the next session and thank you very much for being with us. Keep in mind the admission deadline which is March 15, which is quite soon. Uh, submit your documents in time. Don't be late if you would like to join us next academic year. And if you have any questions to our dear program managers that you're welcome to contact them afterwards. We will also send you the presentation as a follow-up email so you will get the contacts as well and the slides as well. Thank you very much for being with us and uh, see you very soon.
Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our student discussions with uh, students from Natural Sciences Part 2. My name is Liviu Pintilie. I am an international student ambassador of the University of Tartu. And today we're going to find out uh, some more information and uh, some uh, more insight from the lives of students at the University of Tartu. Now, for those who are watching us and are on uh, Workshop, you can find a Q&A button next to each separate info session where you can ask your questions. And if the same question was already asked, please uh, rate the question so that it may come up in the um, um, questions queue. Now, on to our speakers. We have uh, three speakers, two of them uh, right here with me and one uh, through video call. We have uh, Egert, Asfand, and Marta. And now I would like you to uh, introduce yourself a little bit. Egert. Okay, so I'm going to start it off. Uh, as mentioned, my name is uh, Egert, Egert Meller, and I am actually a first year master's student uh, in uh, material science and technology. And as you maybe can tell I am actually an Estonian, so I bring this uh, slightly different insight uh, into this discussion. Okay, um, my name is Asfand Yar and I'm from Pakistan. I am a second year master's student in the bioengineering curriculum. Um, um, as, so now we have a, some cross-cultural country exposure here, Estonian and a foreigner, so yeah, it, I, hopefully it will be a good experience. Okay, and Marta, can you hear us? Yes, I can. <laughs> okay, Hello. great. Uh, my name is Marta. I am from Latvia, and I'm the second year student of Joint Informatics for Urbanized Society. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you so much. Um, I think the first question that should be asked is why Tartu? Why the University of Tartu, of, uh, of all the places? I think uh, it will be interesting to find out the rationale bef behind the uh, you're coming here. So, Marta, what can you s say about your coming here? Yeah, um, obviously, I haven't traveled that far, but uh, the biggest reason was the fact that the University of Tartu has ranked quite far, uh, quite high, and that was a big uh, reason of my choice. And second was obviously the program. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Asand. What about you? Uh, well, for me, it's uh, it's a an unorthodox reason because uh, my uncle uh, is Est is Estonian. Uh, he has been here for like 22 years, so I knew about Estonia since my birth. Uh, but um, the reason why I decided to pursue my master's was because of the university, the state of the art facilities over there, that basically inspired me, and I was like, yeah, this is the time to go forward. Awesome, and I get. Uh, well, Marta said uh, she didn't come from very far. Uh, I, I, I think I'm even from closer since I also did my bachelor's here, mm -hmm. and it just kind of seemed like a logical choice because uh, I, I didn't have any grievances with my uh, studies so far. Mm -hmm. So why not? Good, good, uh, good thinking. So. When it comes to the, to the university, what do you like the most about your studies here? Uh, Eger, you can start. Uh, well, first and foremost, the facilities. I really, I don't have that much of a reference point, but uh, as far as I can tell, as far as I know from what I've heard, uh, here in the University of Tartu, uh, the labs, the study buildings, everything is uh, grade A. Everything is uh, really good. And uh, secondly, I have to say, the working environment, the people here, they are uh, great. I really enjoy my time and the environment I have here. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. Um Asand, did you have any like similar experience? Yes, like so cause coming from like a different educational system and background, I think that it has been a huge improvement for myself first of all. Um, cuz you know you you have things to compare different research cultures, different ways of living and education, teaching. So for me it's it's I agree with the working environment. Yeah, it's it's wonderful. It's really professional and um, I think overall what I like is the like my my curriculum allows you to tailor make your studies to what aims you have for 
it's not like a rigid curriculum you're following. You are the one who decide what you want to study. So that's, I think, the best thing for me. Okay, thank you. And Marta, what is your input on this question? Well, I will agree with the people. The teaching staff is uh, very supportive. And um, uh, when it comes to program itself, it is very uh, practice-based. And I highly value that we do have the chance to actually not only learn the theory, but also have the chance to actually uh, learn these skills practically. Okay, good. Thank you. So we have three students from different uh, programs, Bioengineering, Materials Science and Technology and Geo Informatics. What is it that brought you to this program? Mm, let's see, Asfand, what brought you to... I, I know that uh, you have a long history with Estonia, but uh -huh. uh, why Bioengineering? Well, my background was in biotechnology and I wanted a feel. Um, so it, biotechnology was already a new field um, in its infancy compared to other fields. But um, this bioengineering program, I think I was the second batch that came. And with that, I also wanted to join something that's actually new in the world, not just like in the country, but also actually new in the world, In the even when you're providing the state-of-the-art facilities and stuff. So I wanted to, like, you know, just have my building block in the new development of a new field. Uh, so, for example, like gas fermentation, uh, the lab that I am in, and I feel really proud of that. Nice. Uh, Marta? Uh, yes, yeah, so I have a bachelor's degree in environmental science, and throughout my bachelor's, I closely followed uh, from our faculty. We had some polar researchers, and they uh, presented data, their data basically from a geoinformatics or spatial perspective. Uh, obviously, for example, they made 3D models of uh, glaciers, etc., and that is what piqued my interest and figured out that in environmental science together with geoinformatics is really what's for me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I get it. Uh, well, for me, since I've been little about yay high, uh, I have seriously loved science, everything about science. So when I first came to university, uh, I chose uh, the curriculum of physics, chemistry and material science that is also taught here in the University of Tartu. And uh, in the three years I spent in my bachelor studies, I realized that even though uh, I didn't know at first what material science was, then it turned out to be the thing that I really needed because it takes the practical part of physics and of chemistry and uh, of uh, engineering sciences, and it puts, puts it together into something practical, which I felt I really wanted to pursue uh, after my bachelor's. Thank you. And if you could all describe your program in three words, what words would you choose to describe it? Uh, three words? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Mm. Bioengineering master's program. <laughs> That's just the three <laughs> words out there. <laughs> Are hard to think at the moment. Okay. Well, let's say just one word. Maybe three is too much. One word. <laughs> um, sparkle. Yeah. Sparkle. Sparkle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think this just depicts all the philosophical and abstract meanings behind it. It mm -hmm. just sparkle. You have the chance to do it. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. Um, uh, Marta? Uh, yeah, it's very limiting to try to explain your program in such a way. I came up with four. Uh, okay, good. That would be practicals in multiple sub-directions. No, it's actually three. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, very good. <laughs> and I get I was actually good. also, uh, I got myself geared up for three words, so I came mm -hmm. up with material science rules. <laughs> Short and simple. <laughs> okay, that's very good. <laughs> Okay, so um, now I know that, um, well, Egert is from Estonia, so, um, but I'm going to get back to Egert in a little bit with a question. But for Marta and Asfand, uh, what did you find more most interesting about moving to Estonia? What surprised you? Well, it was 
the culture and the niceness of the people. Like, okay, I knew that, uh, you know, people are nice and everything, but it's really the niceness of people. Like, I've noticed people even at the like grocery shops or just even walking random strangers, they're really nice to you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's just the environment that even, for example, you haven't been in a culture that supports that or people are not that nice. You just turn out to be nice. Mm -hmm. It's just the environment. So I think it's the overall... I, like I've been really enjoying my time here in Estonia. I always think that even let's say I travel further, go work somewhere else, I will always remember this this student experience that I'm having here. Mm -hmm. So it's like a really memorable part of my life now. Mm -hmm. Lovely. <laughs> and Marta, what's your experience? Yeah, um, I personally have been in Estonia and especially Tartu before. So what I would point out would probably be that the uh, lecturers have a bit more um, how to say, laid back or friendly approach, I would say, as compared to my previous university. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Egert, as an Estonian, what is your take on uh, Asfan's and uh, Marta's uh, experiences? Uh, well, I'm I'm actually really glad at what I heard because, uh, you know, the stereotype of Estonians as this uh, northern, cold, sullen people. So I was pleasantly surprised uh, to hear that we're actually nice once uh, you get to know us. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, yeah, that's that's very true. Like in the beginning, they might f you might feel a bit cold. I think it's just a cold war going on. You don't speak, they don't speak. But once you break the ice, it's really wonderful. You you feel at home then. Okay, that's that's very good. And I, I uh, honestly I, I agree with everything, and I feel the same way about uh, the Estonians. Um, and about your programs, what is what do you think is the most valuable thing you've learned so far from your studies? It could be related to strictly the, let's say, maybe life or your studies or your findings. Should yes, yes, yeah. um, I would say in my case, since it's I am in a research field, um, it's the research ethic and also the um, like the work to life balance ratio. Like you get the uh, like it's it's basically versatility. Like you get the chance to do the job whenever you want, but not like at a specific task. As long as you're doing the job with with the right outcome, you are basically relaxed. And I think this is the most efficient and productive way of getting jobs done. So this has been the change in my life, uh, I would say, mm -hmm. in terms of work environment. Mm -hmm. Marta, what do you think about this? Uh, well, <laughs> I will probably more talk about in the program con context, which is be, and it would be basically the capability of doing very special studies over mm -hmm. lots of pl platforms, which will definitely come in handy later. Like this basic uh, versatility and also somewhat um, comfort uh, mm. of uh, like trusting yourself yeah that you can perform all these special studies and uh, that yeah you have learned so much basically mm -hmm. okay good and I get it. Uh, so I as a person who is uh, still studying in his home country but has has had the chance to study with people who have come together from all over the world uh, then I have to say and I know it might sound obvious but uh, diversity uh, breeds uh, creativity mm -hmm. because it's really interesting to see even if we have simple group works together what kind of uh, interesting and cool uh, ideas different people bring to the table just on the virtue of uh, them being from uh, different cultural backgrounds different academic backgrounds and it's really been an eye-opener for me personally yeah. very good uh was there anything in your program that you found, uh, let's say, maybe a bit more difficult than usually, maybe a type of assignment or a type of a way of doing things? What could you name, let's say, name a difficulty in, in your program? Well, in, in my first year when I came, um, like in the, I think it was my first course, one of the first few courses, and it was also a compulsory course, we had quite a lot of, I would say, coursework in terms of like uh, the materials for the exams and everything. But, and I was expecting maybe every course is going to be like this <laughs> onwards, moving onwards. But what turned out was that that was the only course. And after that, it felt really easy. So in a sense, I faced the hardest one in the beginning. Then everything felt really easy. 
but other than that, I think as long as you communicate with the teachers, I don't think there is there is any problem that's supposed to come then. As long as you keep the communication going, you always end up finding a solution. That's that's what my experience has been. Thank you. Uh, Eger, did you find the same difficulty at the beginning? Uh, well, not quite. Uh, my initial experience, since basically I carried on with some of the same lecturers uh, learning you know, still material science as I had been for the last three years in a way, then for me, uh, I guess initially, and this was very personal to just my own experience, was that uh, initially the first courses we took together, uh, our year students, they were kind of meant to bring everybody to the same page. And, uh, and it, it just uh, kind of, uh, felt weird, I guess, to go over some of the same things. So initially, I had this kind of shock. I was thinking that, is there going to be stagnation now? Mm -hmm. But that, uh, once again, turned out not to be true. Because, yeah, that was just uh, the burning difficulties of uh, having so many different people from so many different backgrounds uh, now doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that went uh, away. OK, thank you. Uh, Marta. Uh, I will mention slightly something else. For me, probably, I would say patience. Uh, we do have quite a lot of, as I said, like this practical side, you know, quite a lot of practical tasks and tasks, etc. And sometimes some of these uh, kind of have to be a bit reworked. There are some mistakes, there are some changes in plans, or maybe some data is not what you anticipated. And all of, obviously, it's all of it is part of how it will uh, be actually uh, let's say working in a company or in governmental uh, governmental um, organization, but yeah, I think patience is something that needs to be cultivated. Uh, but uh, generally, I, I I wouldn't say there were some uh, problems we couldn't uh, overcome ultimately. Thank you. I, yep. yes. can, I, can I add one sure. thing? Well, I'm also like the tutor for my first year students and some of them did face some, let's say, cultural shock with the education system because their, their education system was different. So always what always worked for them and what I always also suggested to them was to just talk and communicate with the teachers. Because um, in the end, you know, they also understand this and it's also for the students uh, for the future. Uh, communication is the best. Do not hesitate. Just just go and talk to them. They're humans like us. And in the end, they always find a solution. And, you know, in the end, they're happy then. And then they use the same approach in the future as well. Yeah. Thank you for... Yeah, maybe... Yep. Sure, Martha. Maybe I can quickly. I sure. yeah, fully I agree that the support of uh, teachers is immense and that that's very mm -hmm. that, that helps a lot definitely. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your input. I think the bottom line is that whatever difficulty we might face as students, we always find a solution to it. Um, now, when it comes to um, extracurricular activities, because students uh, do engage in those ones, not just the studies, um, are there any extracurricular, let's say, events, activities that you can find at your faculty? Um, I get it. Uh, you caught me off court with the last uh, last remark there, Ooh. because uh, I was about to suggest something that isn't actually faculty related. Okay, I was sure. just uh, this idea I had. I would mm -hmm. love to have uh, foreign people doing Estonian folk dancing, because mm -hmm. I personally do folk dancing, and I just I could talk on and on mm -hmm. about it for hours. But the bottom line is, it is cool, and mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, a lot of people would like it. I think there's a course for that, so I think m even foreigners there, can. Yeah, there actually is. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Ac on. Actually, I, I love dancing, uh, <laughs> so maybe we, I can learn a few folk dance steps mm -hmm. from you. Um, for, for the extracurricular activities, for let's say for my faculty, um, we have this exhibition event every year. Uh, our program director conducts it, and it's the masters and the bachelor students. All years they just come. Uh, see each other, meet each other, and then there's like since in the last two years there hasn't been much because of COVID, um, but usually we do have some activities, and then we always have those uh, ESN events, um, which students can always enjoy. And you know there are other options that students can themselves conduct some SONAM events and parties like that. So yeah, that's that's also one of those things. But yeah, that's that's all. That's all. Okay, thank you, Asan, uh, Marta. 
Uh, yeah, ESN was mentioned already. Uh, in the context of my department specifically, uh, it was shown earlier that we had this um, 30, uh, we like the students took part in 30 day map challenge, which is in addition like an option to learn to work with data as well as uh, um, design maps. And also beyond that, there are quite a lot of uh, sports activities, both uh, like well, but I am referring to outside of university. Uh, what I think hasn't been mentioned that uh, Tartu, although it's relatively small, there are quite a lot of activities actually to do, which was a very pleasant surprise for me. Okay, thank you. Um, about moving to Estonia, or let's say living in Estonia, and uh, being here and experiencing the, the place, the people, uh, what do you like the most about Tartu and about the country? Well, I would say it's cozy. cozy. You have a home feeling here for some mm -hmm. reason. Like we, we've, I've often discussed this with a lot of students, and we always just say that they've been to Tallinn, different European countries, and you just feel at home in Tartu. There is something like in the air. It's it's kind of like a bit dramatic, but it is true. I mean, once you feel it, you can you can relate to it. Okay, Marta. Well, I could add to it like the fact that yeah, well. What I personally like is that Tartu tar is relatively small, so there are chances to just generally walk or use a bike, and yeah, there, there's quite a lot to see anyway, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Uh, I just I have to add that uh, cozy is the right word, because um, I'm Estonian, mm -hmm. I come from quite close, but I actually come from a city or town that is only of roughly 5,000 people, so more than 10 times smaller than Tartu start to still just feels cozier i yeah it it just is mm -hmm. okay good so cozy is the key word in when it comes to estonia uh, and about the university facilities uh what can you tell me about your labs your cafes your buildings maybe some of the people who are watching us are curious about what amenities uh the faculties have uh, Egert, you can start well, uh, when I answered the question about what I liked the most, and that was actually my, you know, first go-to thing, that uh, the the buildings are uh, nice. They well, I come from uh, Institute of Physics and Chemistry, uh, two separate buildings, and they both have uh, basically basically the basic amenities to live in if you're mm -hmm. kind of desperate-ish. So I'd say everything you would want is mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Asfand or Marta, could you, would you like to add something? We're yeah, I'll just quickly say that um, I was in awe with the facilities available, with mm -hmm. all the technology and things that mm -hmm. you could use to hone up your research skills. So it's definitely a life-changing opportunity. Mm -hmm. Okay. Marta, very well, last words. It's, I, we're running out of time. <laughs> yeah, I agree to everything. Like in our special case, uh, case we also have uh, computer labs, which is obviously very convenient that on your time you can go and... Mm -hmm. Do your work and study there. Okay, well, uh, thank you so much, Asfan, Dagert, and Marta, for your contribution, and thank you, uh, the viewers, for watching us. And please stay tuned for the next uh, rounds of discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Hello everyone again. We are welcoming you to our last for today info session about the master's programs in uh, IT programs. And today we are going to introduce our three programs, computer science, software engineering and robotics and computer engineering. After this, we are also going to host a discussion session with students from this program. So please don't leave exactly after the uh, uh, webinar will be done. Also, I would like to remind you that this is a very good place where you can ask your questions. So if you are watching us from WorkSup, uh, please stand next to the info session. You can find the Q&A uh, button where you can write your questions to us and then we will answer them online. If you uh, want to address your uh, questions specifically to some certain program or specifically to one of the program managers who are going to introduce their programs today, then you can just indicate the name of the program or the name of the speaker. And uh, today with me, I have uh, Eero Vainiko, who is from Computer Science, who is joining us online, and he's going to be uh, presenting the first one. And then the second presentation is going to be about software engineering, about the, uh, and uh, the speaker is going to be Dietmar Pfal. And then the third one is going to be about robotics and computer engineering, and uh, our presenter is uh, Heike Kasse Maggi. Uh, so we are expecting lots of questions from you. Please don't forget to write your questions even during the presentations and we will answer them in the end during the Q&A session. So all in all, I will give a floor to our first speaker who is Eero and Eero is going to introduce computer science program. Eero, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I hope... <laughs> My slides can be opened soon. I welcome you to introduction to Masters of Computer Science program. And uh, I'm very happy that we can do this uh, presentation. And uh, I hope you can get enough information. And if uh, you have any questions, you can then ask later about your uh, questions. That so uh, somehow I cannot see the slides. Is it uh, possible to open this? Yes. Uh, this was. Um, uh, yeah. My name is Eero Weinicko, and I'm professor of distributed systems at the Institute of Computer Science. And, uh, I will talk about master's curriculum on computer science here. And our curriculum consists of modules, and we have seven modules all together. So the first one is base module, which is consisting of four basic courses. And then the second module is to choose from three different specializations, whether it is theoretical informatics and quantum computing, yeah, there is a change uh, from next year. We, in the name, we will separately say also quantum computing here, in addition to theoretical informatics. And the second choice is distributed systems, specialization module, and the third one is artificial intelligence. Then uh, master seminar module is six credits, selectives module, 12 credits, and then optional courses and practice module. And uh, the curriculum is ended with master thesis, which is 30 credits in total that can be do can be done in two uh, parts. So now, more specifically about the modules. So as I said, the base module consists of four courses. Three of them are scheduled for the first semester, and it's very essential for you to pass those courses uh, on the very first attempt. The algorithmics course is the very basic of all computer science we are teaching here. Then design and analysis of algorithms is about theoretical informatics part. Machine learning is for artificial intelligence specializations and distributed systems is for 
as the introduction to specialization of distributed systems. So it means that uh, on your choice of three of those different specializations based on the base model courses, you can actually take uh, uh, elective courses or uh, free choice courses, also some courses from the other specializations. Now, uh, about the specialization modules, all of them are 24 credits, and you have to choose one of those uh, finally towards the end of first semester. Although, actually, during the intake, you already have to write about uh, your choice in the motivation letter, but uh, you still can um, make up the final choice while studying here already. And there is a lot of different courses in theoretical computer science and quantum uh, computing for distributed systems. Parallel computing is one of the essential ones, and there you can learn about cloud computing, intelligent transportation systems, and big data management. Also, uh, DevOps is one of those courses we're dealing here, and now Internet of Things is a cool thing as well. In artificial intelligence, you can uh, actually have some sub-choices from natural language processing, like ne and neural networks, and also uh, bioinformatics, and machine translation, and uh, logics as well. Now, uh, the master seminar is actually six credits you have to choose from different research groups in uh, our institute. And uh, the, each of those different colors actually correspond to different research groups here, where they did on uh, theoretical computer science or com quantum computing research group or distributed systems research group with blue here or artificial intelligence, um, but in addition, you can do also programming language research seminar and data systems research seminar and digital product management as well. So these are like uh, additional possibilities there. In practice module, you have actually 18 credits to take, and the most obvious choice is to go for um, a practical training to some com uh, some company and uh, do the 12 credits or 18 credits altogether. But there are other possibilities as well that you can go for or combine those different choices here. It's actually practice through teaching, mainly teaching on bachelor level. Though, yes, it is mainly for uh, bachelor level courses. So that, uh, a bachelor of computer science here is in Estonian. You might need to know Estonian, at least for part of the courses. Then uh, there is possibility to do entrepreneurship practice with some courses here, like software entrepreneurship project, or introduction to software entrepreneurship. Or you can also get credits for participation in hackathons. There are different choices for that that you can uh, do. And there is also a possibility to do some uh, of the research or completely this uh, practice through doing the practice through research, like the research project in theoretical informatics or distributed systems or data science, or research project in theoretical informatics uh, as a whole, uh, you do larger research project. There. Then the electives module is uh, the one that you can actually use to take whatever courses from our institute and from other specializations as well, mainly. And the only uh, limitation is that this should be our institute's master level course. And connected with the electives module, there is also possibility to do a mobility window, which is actually going to our, uh, some of our partner universities, where you have to do at least 15 credits per semester. And uh, you can do the specialty courses, elective courses, or practice model courses. With uh, 
the fifth module, optional courses. You can choose any course from our university. It is typical to learn some languages. That, or of course, you can take some course that you're really interested in from our institute as well, or from the faculty of science, physics, chemistry, why not? Now, a uh, little bit about uh, studying at the University of Tartu. There are a lot of uh, homework and projects, usually no traditional desktop-based labs here. A lot of online communication, of course, which has uh, started even uh, being more important because of the pandemic, but uh, different uh, uh, social media and teaching media is used like Moodle, we use Zoom, but not the Zoom, MS Teams, Slack, Discord, and possibilities. And yeah, roughly you should think that one ECTS corresponds to 26 hours of work. Also, uh, our labs typically uh, run uh, in uh, normal classes, and each student has to have a laptop, and you can actually borrow one from our institute if you prefer. So, grading system, there are two options, whether it is uh, like uh, uh, A, B, C, D, E, F type of uh, grading or pass or fail courses, and mostly called courses are scored from one zero to 100. And if you have at least 50% done, you get the positive mark. The master thesis <laughs> said it's uh, 30 credits in total, but there is option to do 10 credits in the end of third semester. This would make it more flexible for some people who want to take some special course on the last semester. But you can then start doing your thesis beforehand, and it's uh, really good to get started. To have a look what a thesis looks like at our institute, I suggest you to look at our thesis database, where you see how people and our students, what themes have been cho chosen and how this uh, looks like. Then very important for you probably is to know that you have, we have scholarships available. Uh, officially, this is tuition paying uh, curriculum, but uh, there are 40 tuition waiver stipends, and it means to, to get those 40 non-fee paying positions it is uh, driven so that 31 of those are given to EU students and nine to non-EU students. And in addition, there are 15 fee-paying places. So the tuition fee is 3K euros per semester or 120 euros per ECTS. But uh, there are even more good news that uh, there are some scholarships on top of the three places, like achievement stipend, which you get automatically when you are doing really only A's for your exams and final grades. And then there is European Social Fund stipend, and there is IT Academy Specialization stipend available, Ministry of Foreign Affairs or applicants from Ukraine, some other countries listed here. And then there are some special stipends like Cybernetica Fellowship. And one very special one is an industrial master's in IT program, which essentially means that the last two semesters you work with a company and do part of the studies with them, including your thesis. Now, uh, just to remind you that 15th of March is, a, is the submission deadline to uh, submit your, uh, your, your, uh, your application. And uh, here you know uh, there is information about how to write the motivation letter, which gives 50% of 
of your final grade and uh, the previous level of study gives fifty uh, percent. Well, the writing this motivation letter, the really most important thing is that you write it yourself. You do it uh, in such a way that it is interesting and good to read. And uh, yeah, there are some uh, information how to write it. It's important to answer all those questions here. And uh, yes, we are situated in a modern building in Delta where you can find information and there are some links to additional information where you can contact and ask questions if you have any about this curriculum or admission or whatsoever. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hera, for your presentation. Uh, thank you for outlining the program details and uh, telling about more about admission uh, process. And I would like also to mention that uh, if you would like to see Delta Building, how it looks inside, you can also join us on Wednesday when we are going to have online tours. So you can see actually how Delta Building looks inside and all of these programs uh, that are going to introduced today, they are located in Delta as well. And of course, I would like to remind you to leave your questions. So please, even during the presentation, if you have any questions, leave them. And then afterwards, we will answer them online. And right now, I'm going to give a word to Dietmar, who is going to introduce software engineering program. Dietmar, the floor is yours. Ah, it's on. Okay, so I hope everybody can uh, hear me. So my name is Dietmar Pfahl. I'm a professor of software engineering at the University of Tartu, and I will today talk about the uh, Master of Science in Software Engineering. So, uh, and by the way, many of the things I will say are similar to what Eero said in computer science, because also the Master of Software Engineering is um, directed through the Institute uh, of Computer Science. And uh, our programs are both uh, based in the computer science bachelor program that we also have in this institute. The difference, or one of the big differences, uh, apart from the content or some of the contents uh, of the software engineering program is that it is uh, shared with another university, with the Technical University of Tallinn, with Taltec. So you will see in the next slides that some of our courses are taught in uh, Tartu and some courses are taught in Taltec. That also depends partly on the specialization that you choose. So as I said, um, the program is based, uh, or the basics come from the, comp uh, from the bachelor program and also in the bachelor program we have already some specializations, uh, among others the software engineering specialization, what you see here, uh, on the slide is courses on software engineering, software testing, web app development, software project course, a capstone project course. So these are courses that we in a way expect from all students who apply to the, soft, uh, to the master's program that they are more or less have had similar courses in their bachelor programs. Uh, because uh, the, the whole uh, curriculum of the software engineering uh, program is uh, rather technical. So we expect that you have already a solid basis. So this is now uh, the structure of the program. Uh, you see at the bottom the so-called core module uh, that consists of four courses. Uh, on the next slide, I will show the details. But the important thing about the core module is that uh, these courses are mandatory and there are two of them are taught at uh, Taltec and two of them are taught at the University of Tartu. So all students who take this program have to take these four courses. So, and, and usually you do it in the first semester. And then uh, after the, or during, at the latest during the first semester, you have to make up your mind uh, whether you want to take the enterprise software specialization or the embedded software specialization. The enterprise software specialization is uh, governed by uh, University of Tartu. So uh, basically, if you choose that program, you will mainly be or almost exclusively be at the University of Tartu. Uh, and if you pick the embedded software specialization, you most probably will take most of your remaining courses in the program at Taltec. So each of the specializations has uh, four courses um, and you will see on the next slide how you can choose from 
different uh, sets of courses in each program. Uh, in addition, uh, like in the computer science program, you have also uh, electives and free choice courses. Uh, you can take uh, up to 18 credit points of those courses. The rules are the same as in computer science. The pro uh, these courses have to be offered at master's level uh, to master's level students in one of our institute's programs or in the neighboring institute, actually, also technology institute. And then there's a professional practice uh, where you either can use uh, like teaching practice courses where you are TA in some of the courses that we uh, that we teach in our institute, or you have an internship in a, in a company, and that can be in Estonia, or it could even be combined with some uh, mobility activities uh, in within Europe. And of course, at the end, you also write your thesis, and there are two, three credit point seminars accompanying the thesis. So now let's have a quick look at the core and specialization modules. At, now at the top, you see the core module. The two courses in blue are the ones taught at Tartu University, Agile Software Development and Systems Modeling. Um, and the red courses are taught at Tallinn. So they have a course on, uh, basically it's functional programming advanced, it's called advanced programming. Uh, and some, um, well, basics that all software engineers should know about software quality, software quality standards. Uh, and that is taught also at Taltec. So then, after that, you will uh, either take the embedded system specialization and from next year, uh, I mean, next academic year onwards uh, at Taltec, you can pick four courses out of five. Uh, the telecommunication services and networks course is new. Um, and the other four courses have been taught in the last years already. And it's just to, make, uh, to give you more flexibility, you can now pick four out of five. And in the enterprise system specialization or enterprise software specialization, we have uh, seven courses from which you pick, but you cannot randomly pick. So there's one course that is very basic uh, and very fundamental. It's called enterprise system integration that has to be taken by all students in this specialization. But then you can pick uh, two from three courses on product management, process management, requirements engineering, and one course from business data analytics, big data management, and machine learning. And by the way, those courses uh, that are all that are listed here, and you don't pick uh, for inclusion in the um, in the uh, specialization module, uh, they can of course be taken as an elective course or as an uh, practice. Uh, sorry, as an optional course. Sorry. So the. So the electives module uh, is also different depending on whether you study at Taltec or at Tartu, so whether you take the one or the other specialization. At Taltec, you have a sort of predefined list of courses from which you have to pick. So only those courses shown on the slide on the right-hand side would be eligible um, as elective course in the embedded specialization. In Tartu, you don't see a list of courses because you can, in principle, pick any course that is, as I said earlier, offered to master students. It is sort of the difficulties at the level of a master's course, and it is a technical course taught to our students in our institute's programs. So, so you couldn't take a master level course, let's say, on in Spanish or something like that. Good. Um, the practice and seminar, seminar modules are really very similar to what Eero said uh, in, on the computer science program. On the left-hand side, you see a list of courses that basically you can take as part of the practice module. But in addition to that, uh, any kind of, um, let's say, defined and uh, checked activity in terms of an internship uh, could also count, then it would formally uh, go under the, I think there's something called practical trainings in informatics, uh, so it would be subsumed uh, under those courses. Um, but there's no time now to go into the details. The most important thing is to, for you to know that there are many different ways how you can get your practice module filled up. And the very common one is to, to just simply do internships in companies in Estonia or in Europe. Um, so in the end, when you have completed the program, uh, you should be a really um, a full 
uh, full stack uh, software developer who knows much about all the technical uh, aspects of uh, how to develop software, how to make sure that it has good quality, how to develop it efficiently. Um, that is what you see also in the blue in the blue colored box here. But in addition, we also want that uh, software engineers have some, um, let's say, uh, at least some knowledge about uh, management related activities. And that is in particular, I guess, uh, product management is important, but also process management when it comes to business process management. We have uh, quite uh, good and quite many courses on that topic. Um, and then there are these more analysis-like uh, courses, like business data analytics. So that means that you can also, in the software engineering program, even take courses that are more related to machine learning and artificial intelligence courses, where, where you try to make sense out of data, for example, for, def dif for different um, application domains. There's no problem whatsoever to get a job after you have completed uh, the program. Um, all our students get quite uh, attractive and good jobs either in Estonia. You, here you see a list of companies that, are, that have offices in Estonia, but many of them actually are international and they also have offices in, in Europe and in the UK and in the US. Um, well, there's one thing I should once again mention to you that has to do with the split of the program between Tartu and Tallinn. In the last two years due to the COVID, um, let's see, emergency, um, that, uh, that did not really happen because much of our teaching was done online. But uh, we hope that eventually that will end and we can go back to more regular in-class teaching. And we actually would like, like even that our students learn to know both campuses, both universities, Taltec and University of Tartu. So during the first semester, when you have to pick courses from both universities, we have, of course, made arrangements or we will make arrangements so that this can be done logistically. So even, that, even if you live in Tartu, then you can take the courses at Taltec. There will be a bus shuttle going and uh, the same uh, in the opposite direction. After the first semester, this becomes more or less obsolete because you will either be in Tartu or Tallinn anyways, depending on your specialization. So just a few words about the intake. Um, so these numbers on the slide here show you how many students we typically have after the first two months of the program had started. So it's a bit less than like 55 students. It's a rather, let's say, stable situation. And what you see in blue color are students from European Union countries. And the red part of the column shows students coming from non-EU countries. So the main point of this slide is to show you that there is a rather good uh, split in the middle. So it's about 50% uh, local students, uh, because European Union students are almost all of them are from Estonia, even, even though in the last years, we get also more students coming from other EU countries. And the other, the red color, shows the number of students coming from outside European Union countries. So this is just another view on it. And here you can even see a little bit of split on the type of countries from where our students come from. So you see it's, a, it's, a, it's a quite a big mix, which is quite interesting and quite good. So graduation, so again, the slide, there's no need to really read the numbers. What it tries to show is that, um, first of all, you can graduate at both universities, and that is even independent where your specialization is. So it could turn out that even though you take the embedded specialization, you might want to do a master thesis topic on the supervision of a teacher from Ta uh, University of Tartu, that's possible, and vice versa. And, and the two colors you see here have to do with where students did graduate. And the other important information here is that we manage quite well to really get a high percentage of our students to finish the program successfully. So it's, it's over 80% of the students really make it. And some do it with a little bit of delay. And then uh, it takes maybe one, one year extra. But uh, we are quite successful, actually, in getting almost everybody to complete the program. So what uh, have, do you have to do to apply and get accepted? Um, this is very much the same as for computer science. Um, you have to write a, a motivation letter that gives 50% of the, so let's say, the, the value of your application. So we will have an application 
evaluation committee uh, where we read your letters and we try to see who seems to be more or better matching the profile of the program and the other 50% come from the GPA of your um, bachelor degree. So we, as in the last years, we tried to fill 55 seats uh, in the program. Uh, typically, uh, we do a little bit overbooking, so we rank all the applications. We get 250 plus applications every year. We rank them, and then the top 100, 120 will get an invitation, and typically half of those actually actually take the invitation. As Eero said, for computer science, uh, we, um, we also have uh, tuition waivers because in principle you have to pay for the program, but um, there will be 31, uh, I think that's on the next slide, there will be 30, 31 uh, top ranked students from European Union countries will get a tuition waiver and then an additional 10 of the non-EU students who get an invitation. Uh, will get uh, a tuition waiver. Uh, on top of that, there is also opportunities for scholarships, and um, but that is again exactly the same list of uh, scholarships that Eero has already mentioned in his presentation. So I think that's basically it. Uh, here are also some links. You can find more information on our, our institute webpage, and I guess I can stop here. Thank you very much for your presentation and for so detailed uh, description of the program and the admission process and the uh, students that are studying and graduating at the program. And uh, I would remind you that if you're interested to apply to software engineering, please leave your questions and we are going to answer them after the last presentation is done. And right now we are going to move with our next presentation, which is uh, about robotics and computer engineering program. And I'm giving the word to Heike. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Heike Kosemägi. I am um, Associate Professor of uh, Institute of Technology. And also I'm a program manager of um, robotics and uh, computer engineering. So <clears throat> I have no idea if uh, Eero showed you uh, where are we situated, but um, Estonia is a small, small country in a far, far northeast corner of Europe. Uh, uh, area is uh, quite small, only 45,000 square kilometers. Uh, the population is uh, so small that we claim that uh, once a uh, quarter of our population was covered to this square. Uh, we use uh, euro. Uh, as a currency, uh, our capital looks like on this picture. Uh, we are a member of, um, of uh, European Union and uh, NATO since uh, 2004. So uh, I guess you don't have to worry about uh, the Russians who so, are uh, just next to, uh, just uh, to our side of, of uh, our border. Uh, this picture is uh, actually taken uh, from space, and uh, I put it here because of it was taken from uh, from uh, Estonian first uh, satellite, uh, which was uh, made in our university, and also by by our students. So, uh, first uh, place you reach, um, probably if you come to Estonia by plane, is Tallinn, and then you have to travel to uh, southeast, uh, about 200 kilometers where on the banks of uh, Emaegi lies uh, Tartu. Uh, area is uh, roughly uh, 40 square kilometers. Uh, the population, uh, including uh, students, is, uh, it doesn't exceed uh, 100,000. And uh, the first mention was uh, at um, 10.30 uh, because of uh, some guy just uh, burned it down like always. So uh, our university was founded uh, in uh, 1632 by uh, Swedes. Uh, we have roughly 13,000 students, uh, including uh, 1,700 uh, foreign students and uh, 1,100 uh, PhD students. Uh, we have roughly uh, 3,000 employees. Uh, and also uh, quite a number of uh, PhD thesis defended each year. Uh, that university is divided into um, four faculties, <coughs> and uh, our faculty is uh, science and technology. 
the faculty is divided into institutes uh, by the specialities, and uh, we are under the Institute of Technology. And uh, this is our institute from uh, back view, which uh, looks uh, a little bit better than uh, front view, because uh, there is no just place to look at the uh, front view from distant. Uh, now a bit about um, the curriculum structure. Mm, usually it was put in the first part. Uh, uh, start with a uh, basic module. You have to take it. Um, almost all the courses uh, we offer in this module, uh, 24 credits. And uh, you have to take them because of, uh, to ensure uh, crown knowledge uh, you need uh, to take uh, our courses. When we have a seminar module, which you also have to take, it's uh, 12 credits total. Uh, it can be divided into two parts. Uh, one is a master seminar, where you can uh, share interesting thing to us, and also uh, learn from from our people' uh, experience. Uh, and the uh, second part is either teaching experience or um, uh, practical experience in uh, computer engineering. Uh, the teaching is uh, mostly assisting in uh, in the courses, uh, but um, practical experience uh, here is uh, about going to a science lab and uh, get involved in um, in a piece of uh, research uh, to learn what uh, people do in a science lab and uh, how it's look like. So uh, the next big part is uh, specialization. Uh, it consists of uh, three modules. Uh, you have to pick uh, one of them. Uh, first, of course, uh, robotic, robotics, then uh, computer engineering, and the last one is uh, space module. Uh, each module contains a bit more than 20, uh, 24 credits worth of uh, courses. So you have uh, a bit of freedom to choose. Uh, the next part is a narrow field volume module. It's divided into uh, four, uh, four uh, separate modules. You have to pick one of them. Uh, the first one is um, professional practice. Uh, total of 24 credits. And uh, this means that you uh, strictly speaking, you have to go to work. You have to go to work uh, to private company to get enter enterprise experience. Uh, also, you can call it inter internship, but we expect that a company pays you. Because uh, 24 credits means uh, if you work uh, full time, it's four months. Or if you uh, work part time, it's eight months. So you have to uh, somehow live. Uh, the next one is um, management module, uh, and uh, the third one is economy module. Uh, these are meant for people who are interested uh, either to create their own uh, company or um, go to PhD studies. Uh, and uh, the last one is a semester abroad. This means that you can uh, use, for example, Erasmus to to study uh, in a partner universities, and uh, we uh, well, you can um, you can use those uh, credits uh, in your curriculum. Uh, then uh, optional courses follow, and uh, on the optional courses you can take um, any course in a university you'd like. Uh, no one can tell what you can take and what you can't. And uh, the final part is uh, master's thesis, 30 credits. Uh, and uh, basically, that's it to the structure. Uh, here I listed uh, some courses you can take um, under the um, uh, specialization modules. 
in arbitrary order uh, and uh, all over um, modules. Uh, just to give you uh, some kind of hint. And uh, if I come back to um, to uh, specialization um, modules, um, uh, there is a kind of uh, catch that um, if you don't want to go to internship or abroad or do management or uh, economy, you can actually uh, do or take uh, two uh, specialization modules or actually combine three of them, you can, you can uh, choose the courses uh, from uh, specialization modules uh, up to 48 credits. Kind of uh, set your own uh, learning path. Of course, you have to uh, negotiate with me, but uh, I uh, expect that uh, people who come to master studies uh, know what goals and what they have to do to achieve those. Okay, uh, what we are. Uh, there are three pillars of our activities. It's uh, programming, uh, it's mechanics, and it's electronics. You can do satellites without that. You can do robotics without that. Uh, example of uh, our kind of products. Uh, this is a smart insoil, which measures uh, uh, the pressure when you uh, step uh, step down, and uh, it can record the data. It can give you advice how to run, how to how to step, how to design your shoes. Uh, insight into our labs, uh, and uh, I have to mention these labs are a bit uh, higher class than uh, ordinary student labs. Uh, we have a number of uh, robotic arms, like XARM uh, 7. Uh, on the right, uh, there is our own designed uh, robot called uh, Robotoint or Grabot. Uh, also, uh, already our uh, freshmen uh, create their own robots. Uh, and uh, take part uh, into uh, competitions. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, our students uh, put a satellite into orbit. Uh, right now it uh, has ended uh, its um, active work. But uh, this year uh, the second one is going, going up. Uh, also our engineers have uh, developed a uh, house for Mars. It's the size of a sea container, and uh, it can um, kind of uh, spread out uh, on its own. Uh, and people can uh, work where uh, if the environment is not uh, friendly for humans. Uh, this is what we call the soft robotics. Uh, these uh, slices uh, are a piece of rubber which can move if you apply uh, voltage. And if you reverse the voltage, it can uh, bend into, uh, into another direction. So basically, you can uh, put them, uh, move like a pendulum. Uh, and uh, we can carry, for example, uh, more weight than uh, our own. Of course, uh, we have lots of uh, 3D printers. Also, we're working uh, on uh, printing uh, the same uh, uh, same material using 3D printers. Uh, we are involved in uh, self-driving uh, technology developments. Uh, here you can see uh, Milram's uh, vehicle, uh, both for uh, military and uh, civil purposes, like um, firefighting. Uh, you can be involved in uh, smart solutions, meaning that everything which is wireless collects data uh, which you have to control. Uh, basically, it's called uh, IoT. Uh, and also, uh, you can do lots of fun stuff like uh, click, and, click and grow uh, uh, on the right. 
and uh, I have to mention that these are also student projects. And uh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heike, for so nice presentation and also for showing what you actually can do within the program if you are going to study it. This is really inspiring for our future applicants. So I would like also to point out that we are going to have a tour around the Institute of Technology online video tour, which is going to happen on Wednesday. So please join us and you can see if you choose robotics and computer engineering, where you will be studying and you will see how the building uh, looks inside. And right now, I think I will continue with, we will continue with our Q&A session. And uh, we have received quite many questions regarding admissions. Uh, so I will try to group these questions a little bit together so we can uh, uh, just uh, not answer each separate question, but can answer the question in, in general. So first of all, uh, applicants are writing about different uh, um, requirements to their diplomas. Uh, prerequisite courses to apply to the programs. Uh, for example, we have a question if I have a, a bachelor's degree uh, of science in psychology, can I apply? So maybe we can make a circle and then outline what are actually the requirements to each programs regarding bachelor's qualification and what courses are required to be uh, enrolled to program. Maybe Dietmar, if we start from you. Okay, so um, so first of all, of course, applying apply can everybody. Uh, the question is if you will get admitted. And uh, indeed, uh, for the software engineering program, um, as I try to indicate in my presentation, I mean, we, we expect that you have a very solid uh, knowledge already in how to develop software. Um, we do not, uh, I mean, you cannot learn uh, software development in the master's program. You must already know how to do it. And that means that in what, what we check uh, when we get applications is that if you do not have a, com a bachelor degree in computer uh, science, that is kind of there we expect that you have all you need. But if you have a different degree, then we look into the transcripts and uh, we check if you have taken courses that seem to be beyond just a basic introduction into programming. So meaning you have to have perhaps taken a course uh, on maybe even software engineering, you, maybe you did already a software project, uh, or you um, can somehow demonstrate that you have taken courses, formal courses uh, in, in your home university. Uh, in databases, uh, in uh, algorithms and data structures, and uh, something related. Yeah, mm -hmm. maybe that's enough. Thank you very much. Heike, would you like to continue about your program? Uh, yes, I'd like to emphasize that um, there are three kind of fields you must have knowledge. First is, of course, uh, programming. Uh, I, I don't expect you to be a software de developer. Uh, but a uh, little bit more than Python is good. If you know C, C++, it's perfect. Uh, and uh, if you know only Python, I expect that you can learn to program in, uh, in our languages uh, quite quickly. Uh, second is a knowledge uh, in uh, physics. And uh, I really mean in, in physics. And the second one, uh, you have to know a math. Uh, if you wanna, if you wanna learn a computer engineering, uh, that we can teach you. But uh, we are we are not going to kind of um, help you in uh, basic uh, basic knowledge. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Heike. Ero, what about your program? Yes, similarly, if you have computer science or equivalent bachelor's degree, there are no questions. But if you come from another bachelor degree, then we require that you have at least 24 credits related to computer science, including programming and algorithms and data structures. Mm -hmm. And we'll just look at your transcripts in a similar way as for software engineering. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you very much. And uh, for the applicants who are asking us about their diploma, if you have these courses, I would uh, probably suggest to first uh, uh, ask admission office if you can apply before actually applying, because uh, if you won't qualify, then you won't be considered uh, at any of the programs in IT. Uh, so the next uh, uh, questions that we have is actually career perspectives. So uh, what we can do after graduation, if it's uh, easy or difficult to find a job in Estonia. Uh, what about uh, uh, graduates, where they work nowadays? Do they leave the country? Are they staying? And uh, another question is about the language, if Estonian is uh, necessary to find a job in IT in Estonia. So maybe I also will start with Tietmar because... <laughs> I don't know if you speak Estonian, but uh, yeah. I, I can probably say a few words, but uh, since I'm so old uh, and I will not stay in Estonia after um, retirement now, I, I'm not fluent in Estonian. And um, so the question is, of course, um, a quite good one. Uh, so it's clear that you don't uh, really need to know uh, Estonian for the studies. Um, it's also not really necessary uh, for your internships, uh, but of course, as everywhere in the world, if you want to live in a country, it's always useful to, to learn the language. And um, of course, the IT industry is very international, so the minimum is always English, um, but it depends a bit on the type of company and what sort of customers they have, for example. So if you, for example, have to talk to customers, maybe in Estonia, then it would help uh, to get a job. So in principle, the shortage of workforce in IT industry is very huge, so I think you will always get a job, uh, but maybe you have more options if you start learning Estonian. Um, but uh, it's not it's not a, a, like a prerequisite. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How about your graduates? Are they staying in Estonia ah, or yeah, they tend right. to leave? Or? Yes, we tried to find that out because there's of course no real official statistic on that. But um, we looked into LinkedIn pages and so on. So it's just, uh, so it's clearly so that uh, also the international students, uh, at least fifty percent of them, they usually stay in Estonia working. And uh, of course, what happens after 10 years or so, I have no idea. But in the first few years, uh, most of them uh, who find a job uh, or who are looking for a job in an Estonian company, they, they of course also stay in Estonia. Yeah. So that's also not, not a real problem. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, yes, I guess uh, those who find a job during the studies uh, probably stay in Estonia. Uh, we have also moved uh, uh, moved to Europe, uh, having uh, getting a job uh, in uh, our uh, European countries. Um, one thing I have to admit quite openly that uh, people from countries which are not in good relations to the United States may have problems uh, getting a job in private companies. We have experienced that. Uh, some of our students um, uh, are doing uh, PhD studies, actually, and not uh, Estonian ones, but international students. Uh, but uh, we don't have kind of clear statistics uh, about uh, graduates. So yeah, definitely. Thanks. Thank you, Hero. Would you like also to add something about computer science? Yes, uh, the similar way is uh, our curriculum is that um, many uh, actually continue as a PhD students, whether with us or in other universities in Europe. And a uh, lot of students, I would say, probably in total, probably maybe I have heard some number of 80% of students actually work uh, in Estonia after graduation. And of course, many go to Europe other places. Uh, yeah, generally, it is very easy to find a job, and it's naturally done through our links and our uh, practice internship project. You go for an internship to some company, and you can already try if you fit in that. And the job market is very uh, waiting. 
Thank you very much. We also have a question about scholarships coming. Uh, it was already mentioned during the presentations about the scholarship opportunities, but maybe we just uh, make another round and just uh, again uh, say a few words about the scholarship opportunities about the programs, because there is some uh, separate questions about uh, programs in robotics, are there tuition waivers? So let's maybe just go through each program and then just won't uh, open this topic anymore about the scholarship. So, so, so maybe for software engineering and computer science, maybe I can, uh, maybe Eero can start because I know that you have it on your slides and you know the details because it's exactly the same in both programs. I, I think in, in your program, Heike, it's a, perhaps different, I don't know. But for the scholarships, I think in uh, software engineering and computer science, it's exactly the same and Eero knows better than I. Eero, if you could put, please repeat yeah. the, uh, the information and then we won't come back to this again. So, you know, first, for tuition waiver scholarship, it is done automatically. You can get uh, it uh, through your admission. You already get a letter which says where you have, whether you have got the tuition waiver or you get the fee paying position. And for scholarships, you actually do not do have to do anything explicitly to start with. So, the first uh, round of uh, getting those scholarships is based on admission score. The top level students will get the, 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 the high, highest one will get the most uh, uh, highest uh, paid scholarships. And then there are those special ones for Ukraine, uh, for Azerbaijan, uh, Georgia, and other countries that were listed on my slide. And uh, then, uh, yeah, for, there are still some special scholarships where you apply, actually. It's uh, cybernetical. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Ero. Heike, could, would you like to add something about scholarship opportunities at uh, robotics? Well, first, uh, Tutan Weaver, of course, um, which is uh, 10 to 12 for uh, Estonian and European countries and uh, 1 to 2 for uh, other countries. Uh, also, uh, we have this um, scholarship of uh, Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs, like uh, our programs. It's meant for Azerbaijan and, and uh, those countries. Uh, and uh, also, our students can apply for all our scholarships available in the university. <laughs> uh, and uh, one uh, scholarship uh, I uh, recommend is um, for first-year master students. It's called the uh, Rotelia Foundation uh, Scholarship. Uh, we announce it usually in May. Uh, quite a good amount and uh, yeah. Yeah, so keep an eye on the website and don't miss the chance to apply for a scholarship. Exactly. And we also have all scholarships uh, gathered together on one website. It's uh, scholarshiput.e, so you can also check check them out mm. as well. And there, there was a question if there are tuition waivers uh, at the robotics program. So yes, the, the answer would be yes to that question. Tiet uh, Just as a follow-up, is there also a question about the uh, cost of living uh, and so on coming? There? Um, because, uh, not yet, but yeah. we can also because cover it. Because if it's it is a way, it is related. I mean, maybe one should also say that in Estonia the cost of living is not uh, super high. I mean, maybe it is increasing like everywhere at the moment, but uh, like many international students also see with the situation, let's say in Sweden or Germany or Finland and the countries uh, not so far away from Estonia, uh, there the cost of living is definitely much higher. So um, even the student housing cost, even though I think also there there was a small increase, uh, it's like 150 maybe around that uh, euros uh, per month to uh, to get a room in the student housing. So, so that is actually, I think, quite attractive uh, in, in general. And of course, that applies to all programs. And, you know. Yeah, definitely. It's worth to mention. Maybe our applicants are keeping these questions to the next session when they're going to talk to students and asking them if it's enough money to, to live in Estonia, for example, using your scholarship. All right. A bit related to scholarship uh, question. Are the admission and scholarship criteria mostly GPA-centric or is it like an overall profile? 
that you are considering the Edmar Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, it's clearly 50% uh, is uh, GPA and 50% is kind of we deduce information from the motivation letter. That is actually why you should very carefully read uh, in the admissions, on the admissions web page, what we expect uh, you to tell us during, through your um, uh, motivation letter. Uh, that, that can sort of compensate to some degree uh, with if you have a low GPA, but I can already tell you that uh, in the past years for the software engineering program, the GPA has to be probably something like 75% of 100%, however you calculate it, because obviously in different countries there are different uh, rules how the GPA is communicated. But we try to kind of um, standardize or normalize it in a certain way, and then um, and then we calculate how many out of 100% you have GPA-wise, and then we look at the motivation letter, how well did you answer, do we think you, you have a good profile, and for example, it can help if you write uh, about industry experience, what you have done working for companies, if you have this experience, and that could then compensate if your GPA is not uh, too strong. Okay. Ero, is it the same uh, in your program? Yes, in general, the approach is the same. The 50% is GPA, 50% is motivation letter. But in addition to the very first semester, it's based on this uh, in, uh, intake mm -hmm. score. But, uh, from then, uh, scholarships are actually delivered based on your performance. So if you really are doing very well, getting all, all the A's, you get automatically this 100 euro scholarship already. But on top of that, there are other, other ones available as well. Yes. Heiki, what about your program? Uh, okay, uh, we have um, two parts. Uh, one is uh, GPA, of course. And uh, as far as I uh, remember, it's uh, 40%. And uh, the second part is a bit different for EU countries and non-EU countries. Uh, EU countries uh, can write a motivation letter. It's uh, 60%. Uh, Non-EU countries have to do uh, the test of uh, basic knowledge in physics, programming, and uh, mathematics. Uh, also, uh, uh, EU countries can do the same test if they want to um, kind of uh, be sure that uh, we get the maximum uh, points out of uh, motivation letter part. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, we have also some questions about motivation letters. So how to write a good motivation letter or can I include my GitHub and portfolio, portfolio links in the motivation letter since the application that not, does not require a CV to upload? It would be nice to have a portfolio. Uh, do you have any tips for motivation letters? So maybe we also will make a round and just discuss the motivation letter. What kind of requirements do you have to the applicant and how to write a successful motivation letter? Mm -hmm. Dietmar, I see that you're ready to so, yeah. answer. So, so uh, um, as I said before, so please read carefully what we, write, what we, what we say on the web page for the uh, application for the admission. But just to answer the question directly, um, indeed, Yes, if you have, for example, um, projects uh, that we can, and you provide a link in your motivation letter so that we can look into your uh, repos, uh, that could help us get an understanding on what you have done and how you write uh, the code. Uh, and we actually look into this uh, during the admission round. So yes, indeed, that would help. Uh, so that you provide sort of evidence for whatever you claim that you can or what you know. Right. Uh, the same, of course, we would like to understand. Uh, it would be a good idea to already tell us what specialization you think you will pick so that we see what your goals are. Uh, we also ask actually about the reason why you want to study it, so you should bring up a motivation. Uh, we are not so much interested in uh, why you thought when you were five years old uh, that you wanted to study computer science or software engineering. It's really, I mean, stick to the facts, uh, try to tell us what you did uh, since your bachelor program and and why you want to study software engineering for example and and even when you want to study embedded systems why embedded systems what what is your goal what will you do after you have completed the program mm, yes i think that's it thank you Ero, would you like to add something since your programs are very related uh, 
Yes, so all that is related to software engineering, relates also to uh, computer science. Maybe if you are, want to choose theoretical informatics, you should be also telling something about your interest and ability to do theoretical uh, computer science and mathematics behind it. Also, yes, GitHub links to your projects is very important. And most important thing is that this is an essay that you write yourself. If you do copy paste, it will come out quite uh, automatically through plugin. It's a check anyway, and uh, you lose points very quickly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hey, what about the uh, motivation letter for robotics? First, a motivation letter shows that uh, if you can read or not, <laughs> if you can, it shows that if you answer uh, uh, what is asked uh, for. Uh, for second, uh, including your CV is always a good idea. Uh, also, if you if you include some samples of uh, projects you have uh, accomplished, uh, some robots, some satellites, uh, some videos of those, and also uh, um, you can, or actually you should, if you have uh, this, um, this chance uh, to mention, uh, for example, your experience uh, in Estonia, if you have been here in uh, summer schools, uh, in you know, courses uh, somewhere, and if you name right people who you, who you have met, uh, it's only good for you. <laughs> <laughs> but be aware of that. Uh, I, I can check that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you for such nice tips. Uh, then we have a few very specific uh, questions. Uh, one is, uh, uh, this might be very specific, but what are the opportunities for someone who wants to pursue an area of blockchain for research and development? I even don't know to whom to address this question. <laughs> okay, this is maybe uh, Aero, Aero. You if can you want, I can also say something. But yeah, blockchain and recent developments in computer computer science is of course one of the possibilities to specialize, and we have uh, in each main area of computer science we have somebody who is well known researcher, and blockchain is not. Uh, an exception here. Yeah. Some, some good supervisors for your fees. Thank you. Dietmar? Uh, yes, indeed. So, uh, of course, in both programs, computer science and software engineering, you have the opportunity to, if you like blockchain, uh, to focus on it. Uh, you will also find uh, master thesis supervisors who will be interested. We have already every year uh, quite a few master thesis is where students do something related to blockchain, uh, either already inside the company, so they do it to solve some problems for, uh, let's say, one of the fintechs here in, in Estonia. Uh, so that's, of course, a clear, uh, yes, there are many, many different opportunities, and of course, the field is evolving at the moment. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another question from the applicant who applied already to computer science and software engineering and uh, was uh, accepted uh, last year, but due to some personal emergency problems, couldn't accept the offer. But wants to, but the applicant still wants to apply this year and very much concerned if it would negatively impact this year's applications. Maybe Aero, if you can start. No, we are looking independently. It does not uh, mean that if you were applying last year, you cannot uh, do it again, of course. Yes. Yes, clear. Exactly the yeah, same answer same. as yours. Uh, but yes. may, may I add, uh, yeah, sure. if uh, something like this uh, is related to, for example, uh, robotics and computer engineering, maybe you should mention in your application that you apply it because Mm -hmm. We probably will not check every name against the uh, uh, last year, so that would be... Yeah, if the person already was accepted, so that, yeah, that might be also positive fact. Uh, so a question to robotics and computer engineering. So I don't have enough... Uh, 
uh, enough ECTS in some of the pre-required courses. As a physics student coming from poor science background, can I apply to join robotics and computer engineering program? Mm, physics students usually know physics, uh, we know math, um, and if you can program and uh, pass a test, why not? Yes, you can also maybe before even submitting your application, contact our admission office and consult just more, just in case. So they can also check like on the individual level, the documents, I think. All right, uh, uh, the question about GPA again, how does the admission committee normalize the GPA? Can you please clarify that? Say I have a 8.5 GPA on a scale from 10 and I'm from India. What would be the normalized GPA and is it good GPA compared to the previous years? <laughs> Heiki, if you would like, you can start Trade first. Trade secret. <laughs> To be honest, <laughs> maybe just to add on it. Yes, of course. At the moment, I wouldn't even know by heart all the different uh, normalizations because, of course, we collect information about universities worldwide. Uh, so, just uh, saying that it's from a university in India doesn't really tell us much. Let's say that if you're from one of the top universities in India, then it might be better than if it's a university where we can't even figure out where it is ranked. But uh, in principle, of course, we use some, uh, we know about the different grading systems in different uh, cl countries like UK, India, uh, Pakistan. Uh, so, so we try to be fair, uh, of course. Um, and we cannot e say what is uh, enough because it really depends uh, on who is applying. <laughs> and uh, this is changing, uh, of course, a little bit every year. Yeah. Okay, I think that would be enough for this question. So there are some questions about the internship, how difficult to find the internship, and also if it's possible to combine work and studies. So maybe we can also make the round and include all of the programs and then uh, answer these questions as well. So another question here is the university also assist in can find an internship. So internship or and work, combining work and uh, studies. I guess I should start. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. So, so in principle, um, there's first of all, I would like to say that uh, you should remember that this is a full-time study place. Uh, so in principle, if you did your core module plus the one extra course, like a specialization course or optional course in the first semester, it's a 40 to 50 hour week workload. I, it's it's very difficult for me to uh, to think that you could have a full-time job at the same time, uh, just to make that uh, also clear. Uh, of course, in principle, it might be possible to work part-time in parallel, uh, and it also depends, of course, it's individual, it depends on what you do and how you do it and so on. Uh, so, so, but be careful. I mean, don't think you can do a full-time job at least in the first year of the program uh, in parallel to the studies. I think uh, you could maybe do it if you are super smart, but I think it's very, very difficult. So that's the one thing about the internships and does the university help? Yes, uh, we have, for example, this week there will be a so-called career, how's it festival. called, Car career festival, festival or something, where where company and that happens every year, uh, where companies uh, are in a in some place very close to our uh, university buildings. Uh, have a kind of fair where they show what they what they do, where they need people, where they need students for internships. And if you are just a little bit active and go there, talk to companies, you will probably find something. We have a web page where we list uh, internships. Uh, plus, we have also even a special internship, let's say, con counselor, so to speak, who can also help to t tell you or explain what are the rules because you cannot do anything as an internship. It has to be related to the study program, of course. But uh, yes, so the short answer is yes, there is some support. Yeah. Ero, would you like to also to add something? Yeah, I would just probably add that it's very typical to do internship during summer of the second semester. Uh, so normally, 18 credits will be three months, like full work. And you can do like two months already during the summer and then part 
time later, for example. Mm -hmm. And indeed, the Institute Career Day is the best place mm -hmm. where to look for uh, internship place. Just to add on that, on top of that, uh, that also many of our master, I mean, students who do the master thesis are actually working it together. I mean, on a topic where they are in a company. Again, that should be, of course, discussed with the supervisor how to how to find out how to combine this. But that is quite typical. So, in principle, in the very beginning of the program, uh, we do not recommend to work too much on the side. But then, uh, gradually, that can increase. And the internship is usually the booster to then, in the second year, do more work. And as I said, you can even combine your master thesis uh, with working in a company. Thank you. Thank you. What about your program? Um, and I talked about uh, curriculum structure, I didn't mention that um, we try to run all our courses uh, each year, which means that uh, you can take all your, uh, all your courses uh, within one year. Uh, in the spring we usually have a career day uh, so in computer science. And uh, when you can, uh, if, you, if you go into an internship, uh, you can uh, pick a companies. You can negotiate with them, uh, also you can start uh, already in summer. Uh, and uh, in this way you can have um, the third semester for internship and uh, the last semester for a thesis or combined. And um, it's uh, usually in this way that the internship uh, grows into a thesis and uh, also into employment. Uh, and it would be funny if it won't be that way. Uh, and uh, regarding uh, the jobs in Estonia, we say that uh, there is a lack of at least thousands of uh, people in uh, software developing field, also in um, hardware developing field, so <laughs> just show up and uh, I guess you can find a job. <laughs> Thank you very much. And what about working and studying together? at your program is uh, happening and would you recommend it? Don't suggest that uh, during the first year uh, unless you uh, don't have that much finances uh, because it takes time to find a job if you are new here uh, but if you are already doing your internship uh, we expect uh, that companies pay you and also, uh, if you uh, do your master thesis on uh, company's projects, then uh, it's uh, when, when you can uh, show your skills what you uh, what you got uh, during the internship. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we have some questions regarding also admission. Uh, first of all, uh, one of the applicant is asking, can you edit the application once submitted and add the CV or uh, tweak a motivation letter based on advice given here? So someone would like to change now motivation based on the advice that uh, he or she was heard today. But unfortunately, if the application is submitted, it's not possible to edit it anymore. I, I guess uh, you can you can always connect to admission office and, uh, and ask them to add it yeah. or they can uh, show a way how to do it. Yeah, you well, yeah, there is a possibility. I think uh, you can drop an email admissions at ut.de and just try it out. But normally it's uh, it's you can't do it yourself without any extra help from admission office because it's already submitted and it's not e editable anymore. Uh, hi. Uh, during the admission process, does it help if uh, you have some previous research, ex research experience, like a research paper uh, you have worked on previously, and would it be okay to include its reference in the motivation letter? Uh, Dietmar, if you can start. Yes, uh, there's no reason why it should not be okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. If you think it's relevant, I mean, of course, you should think it's re if if it is relevant for the program. Uh, yes, of course, you can do that. Yeah. Thank you. Well, same. Yeah. Arrow. Yeah, same with computer science. Yeah. So we'll, we'll add you at some point. So definitely. Uh, next question is about reference letter. Do we need to attach some reference letter? Not specified which program this person yeah not specified uh, to which program but maybe we can say uh, to every program 
die het maar even kunt starten. Yeah. So, so I mean, uh, once again, uh, the, what we look at is the motivation letter and the GPA. Uh, but uh, of course, we always, uh, I guess, all of us, we, we can, we have access to, like, for the international students who apply through the Dream Apply, we have access to all the documents that you submit, and like, for example, also CV. Uh, but it's not necessarily so that we look at it. Uh, and when I get, the, if uh, sometimes I see like like references, like one paragraph of somebody from some company, and I mean, it does probably not really help much. Maybe the only thing it gets, gives us, the only information that we get is that probably you really worked in that company from date one to date two, but that's it. But we are not really, uh, it's not so important for us. Yeah. At least um, not in my program. Unless you get one from Elon Musk, for example, <laughs> personally. <laughs> uh, well, uh, yeah. Mm, well, can you imagine that uh, you have uh, reference uh, letters uh, from three Indian professors uh, I have never met. I know nothing about it, about them. But if you have a reference letter from Estonia, from people I know, this is valuable for you. So, thank you. Hello, how about reference letter considered at commu computer science program? It is yeah, approximately the same. Mm -hmm. The same. Okay, we will take our last question for today because we are running out of time, and the question is addressed to Dietmar. And uh, the question is quite long, so since, uh, since Mr. Dietmar mentioned the rank of the university in our home country, I live in Iran. I have studied in a low-ranked university because I was from an uneducated family and lived in a small city and low quality of life. However, after the first two years of my bachelor's degree, I migrated to the capital of my country and studied in a better college of my university and also started to work in research groups at the most respected and highly ranked university in my country, University of Tehran, for three years. And I have the full support of the professors I have been working with. Does the admission committee take this into account that I have been trying to fulfill this negative part of my uneducational background by looking at my CV? To, to be honest, I haven't really understood what the problem is if you have your bachelor degree in the end from this one of these top universities in Tehran. Is that what you said? Because then you are from a top university of Tehran, which at least used to be quite good universities as far as I know. So I'm not fully sure what the problem is, uh, to be honest. <laughs> Yeah, and I guess more attention you will pay on the GPA of the bachelor's diploma and on, on the course. Ah, sorry, so, yeah. so this other program was not the master's, it was, but, uh, because college for me is bachelor degree, so I didn't understand. So you have also a master's degree, maybe, or... Uh, uh, it's not written, only yeah. bachelor's degree. Yeah, that's why I yeah. think it's... Yeah. Did not, okay, it depends on the individual case. Yeah. yeah, but I would recommend to maybe just contact separately uh, Dietmar and then ask this question. Okay, it seems that we are out of time. Uh, thank you very much for being with us today and thank you for all of your questions. If, st if you still have some questions left, then uh, you can also contact separately our program managers who are going to be very happy to help you. Also, we are going to send you all the presentations and then you will have a recording so you will be able also to see more information from the slides. And thank you for being with us and uh, don't leave, please. We have our final discussion round with students from the same programs that were just introduced. So stay with us and ask your questions to the students. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe just contact separately uh, Dietmar and then ask this question.
Hello and welcome back to the Open Doors Week. Right now we're going to be starting a discussion round with some of our students from the Information Technologies field. Um, if you do have any questions or some questions should arise during, uh, feel free to place them in the chats and we'll take a look at them. Um, but with me I have three wonderful uh, students here. Uh, if you guys would like to introduce yourself, oi, why don't you start out? Sure, hello. Uh, my name is Oit. Uh, I study computer science here in the University of Tartu. Uh, I am currently on my second year on my studies. Uh, yeah, uh, my specialization is distributed systems. Yeah, and the second year, so I'm currently quite heavy into writing my thesis. Hello, uh, my name is Carolina, and I'm a, a first year software engineering master student and my specialization is uh, enterprise software engineering and uh, I'm Stan I'm studying uh, computer engineering and robotics uh, first year so I have only studied for one semester at this time and for my speciali specialization uh, uh, I'd say computer engineering it's a bit of both all right, awesome. Thank you guys for coming and talking with us today, answering some questions. Uh, I wanted to start out with one, maybe a little bit more about your program. Uh, you know, uh, kind of have a stigma with information technology it might be a little bit difficult to get into or uh, study in general. So, uh, Sten, what would you say is the hardest part about your program? Um, hardest part, uh, maybe that you kind of have to do everything. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't to simply have just uh, some programming or just math. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to do and know everything from uh, hardware to software. Yeah, definitely. No, no shortcuts. Yeah. All right. Awesome. And uh, same question to you, Carolina. Um, for me, I guess uh, if I compare it with my bachelor's, then um, right now it's a lot of technologies, different technologies that I have to learn, like just like get it in really quickly to uh, get on with the tasks. So uh, a lot of different technologies, but I also feel that it's gonna be a really good advantage uh, later on if I know really different things and it really helps, I guess. Yeah, that's awesome. Wait, the same question to you as well. Um, I would say the fact that like all the courses are quite uh, sophisticated and require a lot of uh, like attention, and that translates to a lot of spent time there as well. So, so you really have to dedicate to it. Uh, of course, you get the return out of it. Like it's, uh, they are all great courses, uh, especially if if it really overlaps with your interests. But yeah, that's one thing that requires some dedication, definitely, to get done. Yeah. So you would say it, it uh, requires a lot of independent study, kind of working on your own outside of the classroom too. Yeah, yeah, definitely, especially considering last year's, uh, I mean, our studies have mostly been uh, remote, uh, which like if it suits you, it's great. You can watch that, watch the lecture, you can pause it uh, if you want to, I don't know, grab a snack or whatever and then return to it in your own time. So you can like accommodate it to your life, which is great, but you, yeah, it requires you to have this individual um, uh, time planning skills, I guess. Yeah, definitely. Um, I know you guys are a little bit new, uh, your first semester students, but uh, maybe what would you say is one thing that uh, you can tell to somebody maybe coming into University of Tartu or maybe it's their first semester, what's one tip for success uh, coming to the University of Tartu? I mean, you guys can take a second, Stan, if you want to start out, or if Carolina, you have an answer first, then maybe we'll, we'll go over to the veteran over there. <laughs> Like, maybe it's not a tip, but uh, there's really nothing to be afraid. Uh, like, uh, as, it, as it's been said, I've been studying for one semester, but uh, to my experience, it's pretty much the same as bachelor's. Mm -hmm. So there's really nothing that new. Yeah. It's just two more years. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Carolina? Um, maybe in software engineering, as for the first semester, there are pretty many groups. Uh, assignments, mm -hmm. then uh, start to communicate with everyone uh, as quickly as you can to find yourself a good team. And if you will be able to 
find yourself a good team, you're gonna be so like, it's gonna be so enjoyable. That's that's the tip I have, yeah. So relying on your peers is like one one of one of the yes, best definitely. things to do. Yes, definitely. You can, yeah. cannot do stuff on, alone. Yeah, yeah. definitely. <laughs> okay, right. Yeah, I think uh, I agree that, uh, and in general, like, be proactive in your in your studies. That when when you have like a deadline or you have to do something, uh, like do it in advance or like if you need to assign or like assemble a group for a project, like I don't know, just uh, reach out to the guys who are vocal in uh, in lectures and ask them like hey can we do the project together and you'll get a good team and stuff like that and like when you you have to like pick some uh, modules you have to pick your specialization then uh, like it's good to know the courses in advance you can just talk to the lecturers they're very like open about uh, their their courses and and you can get a lot of information already there like what suits you what interests you and uh, uh, it it also translates to the thesis. Like if you if you if you are open, you go and communicate with your lecturers. You will most probably find a good topic for your thesis, and uh, and yeah, you'll have a good time. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, I understand you guys are all uh, Estonian, but uh, I would like to ask you, what do you guys think about living in Tartu? I know Carolina, you're from Tartu, so <laughs> maybe you have a, you have an insider perspective. Yeah, actually, um, I don't really want to go anywhere. Like the the reason I'm here in Tartu is because I really love it here. Mm -hmm. uh, I can I can really feel that I can study what I want here and that. Uh, I will really get the good education and uh, that's really important for me and also the people here uh, are really nice although Estonians might seem a bit cold but uh, I still like it and also uh, in the masters as now we have uh, some international students uh, they are all super supportive here so I really like that yeah you guys don't seem too cold to me so it's all right <laughs> uh, Stan well, what would you say uh, I would simply say that it's peaceful here mm -hmm. so I come I come from the near the capital mm -hmm. and like uh, there's more rush in there and yeah. <laughs> Tartu really is a simply a peaceful place to be yeah, I, I kind of have the the same kind of perspective on that. It's a lot slower kind of yeah, lifestyle. Yeah, people yeah. walk slower in the streets. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Wait, uh, how, how do you like living in Tartu? I definitely like it. I also like the uh, slower pace. Uh, it lets you focus on your studies uh, a lot. I also like the fact that you can walk er everywhere. You don't need a car. Or if you really need to go somewhere far, you can just take the bus. Um, and uh, like... If there's a lot of opportunities here, like it's it's a small, it's a, sm a rather small city, but the university is great, and like for our fields, there's lots of uh, opportunities for like uh, employment as well. There's like great uh, software companies around the city, and uh, like yeah, there's lots of opportunities. I would say. Yeah. Uh, speaking speaking on that a little bit, uh, what do you think are your plans for after graduation or? Uh, you know, once you once you do finish your studies. Um, well, my plan is to continue working at the place where I have already worked for a couple of years. Uh, of course, with uh, a bit of a smaller schedule than full time uh, during the studies, uh, and uh, then maybe possibly go work abroad as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, awesome, Carolina. For me, I think I'm going to apply for doctoral studies here in Tartu. So anyone who is planning on doing a doctoral degree, then uh, I, I think coming here in master's is a good like trial run to see if you like the university. And we are really happy to have you here. Awesome. Yeah, and uh, I plan to stay in Tartu, mm -hmm. fi find a job. Uh, yeah, actually, I plan to find a job already in the summer. Oh. and keep doing it awesome great yeah so generally you guys say you like you guys like studying at the university here would that be an accurate statement <laughs> uh what would be uh your favorite thing about the university of tartu maybe compared to other places you've studied or just in general like what do you guys think is your favorite thing here Lately, I think the new building. New that's building. that's yeah. Everyone seems to like it, and yeah, it's it's really good. The new building is pretty great. <laughs> Stan. 
I don't have uh, experience in another university, mm. so don't really have a good answer. But like every aspect that I can see, nothing to really like say bad about. All right, awesome. And you as well. Um, yeah, um, Carolina had the answer. The building is really good. Yeah. But but maybe to add to that, I think the university is quite. Uh, uh, I, I, welcoming of uh, of students coming from abroad and like there's a large community of students here around town you see them you interact with them especially like the people you study with and uh, yeah you probably make a lot of like new friends from places you won't imagine that you're yeah yeah the city is like very international and whatnot um do you guys like like to prefer to study at home or do you guys use the facilities here and use the study rooms and whatnot? Where do you guys like to do your studying? I personally like to use the Delta building. It has a lot of opportunities for studying and I see a lot of international students also gather here. Um, and we also have some study sessions together with groups. So it's really good like when, when people are proactive, which uh, with the uh, recommended to be, then uh, you'll get uh, good friends really quickly and then you can form the study groups and come to the Delta building, book yourself a room and study together and it's so much more fun. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I definitely prefer to study at home, mm -hmm. uh, partly because uh, the new building has come up a lot and in computer engineering and robotics uh, the studies actually don't actually yeah, don't take place in here. The, we have a bit of an older building and uh, thus maybe not so many cozy places to hang around. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. And wait. Uh, yeah, I also prefer to study at home. It's quite convenient if you have like long ho homeworks or just individual work. Uh, but occasionally we also, when we have group projects, we gather at someone's house. So we meet up, we we chill and we do the studying as well. And yeah. uh, would you guys say that uh, for your specific programs, uh, you had to have like a lot of prior knowledge to be coming in, or uh, do you think it kind of started from ground zero? Uh, wait, do you have uh, I would say that like prior knowledge helps uh, for computer science, but uh, the first semester is mainly designed to get everyone up to some level uh, that's uh, like required or suffi sufficient for continuing the studies. So you have like uh, courses, um, for example, the algorithmics course, which is just uh, lazy. Even if you have a good foundation on algorithms and data structures, it gives you a very uh, solid uh, extra foundation to further build your studies on. And also we have those um, introductory courses from each specialization so you find the one uh, that uh, suits you or interests you the most. All right, thanks. Uh, for those who watched the um, introduction session with program managers, then Dietmar for software engineering also already said that uh, they assume that you have some knowledge in software engineering, so we are not uh, starting from zero. So if you don't feel too confident, I still recommend uh, applying. You can um, maybe prepare, your, pre pre prepare yourself during the summer a little bit, but uh, also when you come here, then there's an opportunity for you to take some bachelor courses that uh, the people who come from Estonia have mm -hmm. taken in bachelor, so that's what is kind of assumed. And then you can take your, those courses yourself so you can get uh, going. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I concur that uh, previous experience is really, really recommended. Uh, we have students that uh, seem to be, uh, let's say, lacking of experience mm. and uh, they seem actually to get along fine, but uh, with a lot more effort put into it. So that meaning that uh, if you are really motivated, not really, nothing really stopping you, Mm -hmm. but recommend it to have experience. Yeah, great. Um, so you, are you guys' courses are in Estonian, correct? Or are they uh, English taught courses? No, well? they are English. English, English okay. Yeah. English, okay. So uh, do you guys have a lot of uh, international students coming and uh, joining your programs as well? 
is it like a very mixed group or is it mostly just Estonians like we have here? Uh, I would say that uh, two thirds are international students okay. and a third are Estonians. Yeah, actually, it's it's pretty weird that we are here all Estonians yeah. because <laughs> we mostly have international students in our like programs. But um, I mean, most of the lecturers here are in international as well. Mm -hmm. So like the scene is really like including. Yeah, yeah. Same goes for computer science. Um, you have a mix of Estonians and international students, a bit more inclined towards international students in the masters. Yeah. Okay. Have you guys considered uh, studying abroad, uh, taking advantage of any of the programs, and or have you already? Um, I've heard that we have Erasmus Plus, uh, plus uh, um, programs here. Uh, I personally haven't applied because, as I said earlier, I really love it here in Tartu and I want to really be here. So, but. Um, uh, for the international students, I don't know if you're coming to Tartu, then it's already new. So, I'm, but if you really love to travel, then it's gonna be like really cool that you come here in Tartu, and then you can do a semester somewhere else, and then come back, and you can really like travel a lot if you want to. That's awesome. Yeah, definitely, I already feel like I'm studying abroad here, like a little bit of adventure. So, <laughs> uh, what about you, Sen? Uh, no, haven't considered uh, going abroad. That's that's fine too. <laughs> Wait, uh, maybe if I ever go to do a PhD, I would do it abroad. But uh, after the masters, I have to take a bit of a break from studying. Okay. Uh, are you guys uh, concurrent with your studies? Are you guys also doing any internships or working at the same time? Or do you think you'd have time to do that just with the level of uh, you know of your studies? Yeah, I also been working since uh, the start of my bachelor studies. Mm -hmm. uh, not really uh, the professional, like uh, computer engineering job, yeah. uh, like related to photography. Okay. But uh, I think there is time, and uh, a bunch of us uh, of our uh, uh, like our co students are doing it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also like to mention that uh, a good opportunity in the university is to uh, teach, actually. Mm -hmm. Like, if you have passed the subject, then it's uh, always possible to start teaching it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So maybe maybe I'm a bit old one out here because um, I'm actually uh, working here in the university. So I was really... Um, uh, lucky to get a position in a research group and I really really like it because it lets me kind of integrate what I'm studying with what I'm doing at work. Um, also as uh, Sten said um, I'm, I've been teaching uh, some courses which I really really like so that's that's a really great opportunity but uh, from my master's studies, um, I've, I've seen a lot of people having internships mm -hmm. and actually working uh, uh, during the university times, and also in our program, uh, uh, quite a bit of ECTS come from practice. So at some point, you have to do it anyway. So everybody does that here. <laughs> yeah, all right. Uh, yeah, uh, I've also been working during my studies, but my recommendation actually would be to maybe considering, uh, like, I don't know how hard you want to work, but yeah, uh, the recommendation would be to take the first semester to concentrate on, on studying uh, just to adjust to the university load. Uh, you can take uh, ECTs or like courses uh, in advance, so do more than the required amount in the first semester. Mm -hmm. That will take some load off from the next semesters, and then you have like a, a bit of extra time to do an internship or, or, or start working. All right. Yeah. Thank you, guys. <laughs> really, really enjoyed talking to you. you. Guys, have any like final closing closing thoughts? Maybe just one little one liner about your program you'd like to shoot off before we uh, end the session here. Uh, not gonna be a one liner, oh. but <laughs> <Close> um, <enough. laughs> uh, computer engineering and robotics is kind of something for everyone. Mm -hmm. The uh, the curriculum isn't strict. You can pretty much uh, choose maybe half of your subjects. And I think that's a big pro. All right, yeah. Uh, although software engineering 
uh, seems more like something that you do the masters and then you go to work, then I really encourage people to come here and continue in doctoral studies. And I'll, I'll be waiting here for you. And I, I really want you to come. Really. Yeah, you'll, you'll see Carolina as your, as your instructor, your professor. <laughs> All right. Wait. Um, I don't have a one-liner either, but I'll try to say something. Uh, uh, well, I would say that uh, if you come here to study, uh, you will definitely get like uh, a state-of-the-art uh, education. So the specialization modules, for example, we have a very strong, uh, um, yeah, like the courses that are given on artificial intelligence, which is one of the specializations. Uh, the lecturers and the faculty is very strong and my specialization as well distributed systems it's like you will get a very good education here yeah. all right again thank you guys so much uh, that's going to be the end of our student discussion here uh, if we're, we're going to have more student discussions um, throughout the rest of the Open Doors week. Um, but today, this is the last one. I can say we saved the best for last, maybe. But, <laughs> but uh, that'll be us uh, closing it off right there. Thank you so much for your questions. And thank you guys for uh, tuning in here. Thank you very much, everyone, for being with us today. We have hosted today four excellent info sessions in medical sciences, two info sessions in natural sciences, and the last info sessions in IT, plus uh, three student discussions with our students. We hope that you enjoyed the first day of the Open Doors Week, and we hope that you learned a lot of information that will be useful for you during the application process, or if you have already applied, uh, will be useful for your studies and for your relocation to Estonia. Uh, but more is coming. Tomorrow we are going to continue with more info sessions and more student discussions. So please stay with us and uh, thank you for being with us today and see you tomorrow.